Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, and hello, kids, and welcome to Season 3 and Episode number 325 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah! Today, recording day is Monday, February 26, 2024, and it looks like it's going to be a lovely day here at the Beaver Lodge. I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. I love that we have them still with us after all this time. But before we do anything else, let's say hello to you, Mr. Grizzly, and ask you how's your mental health doing today, sir? Well, good morning, Mr. Beaver. My mental health. Um, hmm. You know, I, I think it's actually pretty good. I just, uh, I'm, I'm feeling a lot of empathy for someone close to me right now. So uh, I think my mental health is good. I'm just worried about somebody. Um, and we'll leave it at that. Okay. But, uh, had a busy weekend. Had a very busy weekend. Friday went to... Uh, uh, Bridget and I went to see uh, Ruby Waters, Nathaniel Rateliff in the Night Sweats, and uh, City in Color at the Canadian Tire Center. Oh, nice. So we, we walk in to the stadium and, you know, start going up the stairs to get our tickets checked. And there's a, a woman standing there. And Bridget's like, so listen, um, he convinced me to take the bus here, but I think I want to take a, t- a taxi home. Where do we get a, t- a cab or an Uber or anything? And the woman just looks and she goes, I know you. And it turns out, yes. We had met at a uh, C, uh, CIBC run for the cure back in September, her and her husband. So we sat and had a nice chat and then up the stairs, grab a beer. And as we're walking towards the seats, uh, this woman just jumps out in front of me with this big smile. I'm like, oh my God, my friend Christine, who, who you know, I haven't seen her since pre-pandemic times. We used to oh, paddle, nice. we used to paddle a dragon boat together. We used to paddle. So in dragon boat and her husband, Jeff was there. So it was nice to see them. And then we go get to our row. I was like, oh, here's our section. Go down. And here's our seats right here. We're one and two, right on the end, right on the aisle. And as we're walking in, this woman looks up at Bridget and goes, oh, my God, Bridget. And then looks over. She goes, is that Paul? Paul, hi. And I'm like, hello, hi. Um, thinking I'm supposed to. It, it's the Ray girl. She was sitting in our row. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. She goes, it's the Ray girl. I'm like, oh, my God, it is. Like, I recognized her when she said it. But prior to that, I was kind of like, I. I think I'm supposed to know this person, but <laughs> a little, you know, a little, uh, the old memory's not what it once was. Uh, multiple concussions. I see people all the time and I don't necessarily remember their names. I remember who they are and where we met. This is the first time we actually met in person in real life. So, yeah, that was really cool. It's like, you know, so small, small town Ottawa, you know, 1.6 million people in Ottawa, Gatineau, and I bump into a bunch of them at a concert where there's like 15,000. So, <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. yeah. 
Ah, oh, so is that the first time that somebody from the show recognizes you on the on the street? Uh, uh, maybe. I, I don't know. I honestly, honestly, I don't know. Uh, okay, because it's happened to me twice now, and it's kind of it's always a little fun but weird. <laughs> uh, I, I honestly, I, I, I don't know, and I say that because again, my memory's not so great anymore. So maybe let's see if I got a photo here of us. Uh, find a. Find for one that, it, that's good. There's a bunch of us. Yeah, for me, it always is a little weird because at first it's like, hey, are you that guy? And then it's like you get that one moment of, why do you want to know? <laughs> and then it's like, I love your show. And then it's like, oh, God, don't say something stupid to ruin the impression that they have of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what's here. I got I got a few photos here. I'm just trying to find a good one. I don't care how I look. I just want to make sure everybody else looks good. I'm I'm always looking disheveled. Oh, <laughs> You're always looking disheveled. Always uh, disheveled. Yeah. <laughs> here's here's one of three of us. Here I'll share this on the screen for you. There. Just give me a sec while I pull it up. And, and here we go. There we are. Yeah. So there's the three of us. Ah, uh, hello, lovelies. Let's see. There we go. Some good photos there. Yeah. Ah, that's wonderful. Ah, yay. That was really cool. That was really cool. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, literally, we're sitting in the same row. Like, she was, the, we were seats one and two. Uh, they were five and six. <laughs> see, what are the odds? Yeah. yeah. That's and, the, and the other people who were, there were other people who sat beside us, but they didn't show up until City and Color took the stage, the you know the the uh, the main event, if you will. Yeah. So they missed the first two acts, which was a bummer because Nathaniel Rateliff put on a great show, as did Ruby Waters. It was a, it was a good show. Great, I'm glad to hear that. Ah, I see we have some kits with us. Good morning, Kit Linda M. Good morning, Kit Toronto Dan. Good morning, Kit Saucy. Nice to have you with us from uh, the beginning this morning. I know it's been a while. Good morning, Kit Ellen, Kit Elaine, Kit Mike H. Nice to see you, my friend. Who else do we have? Ah, Mademoiselle Fox. Good morning, my dear. You look lovely in those photos, by the way. Who else do we have? Who else do we have? Kit PNC Bio. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning to you. Good morning, Kit Mohan. I hope that uh, Mateo is feeling much better. I can identify with Miss Shattuca. Um, yes. Because I did that last week too. I went two days, just absent-mindedly forgot, and it was like I don't feel right. Yeah, you want to get that script to today if you can, because you know two days is not the end of the world, but you do start to feel off. You don't feel like yourself. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Kit Jillian. Bon matin, les bébés castards. Says Kit PM Godin. Bon matin à vous aussi, mon ami. Uh, who else do we have? A bonjour à tout le monde à Caraquette as well. <laughs> uh, let's see. See, see, see. Who else? Miss Shadika. Good morning, my dear. Lovely to see you as well. Going through. Ah, Kit Leanne. Hey, how are you doing? How is the Camp for kind Kindness going? If you've got any updates, please let us know. And uh, give our best to Kit Angela, because I'm sure she's uh, over there. Ah, oh, that seems to be everybody so far in the chat. Um, I had, oh, oh, Kit Donna, sorry, I missed you. Good morning. There you go. Um, I had a, well, a rather calm weekend because I haven't been feeling the best. Mm -hmm. And uh, there has been uh, no, um, uh, up until yesterday, there's been no improvement. Uh, thank goodness for the Scotties being on or else I would have been bored out of my mind. So it kept you kept you preoccupied, did it? Kept me preoccupied, but I mean the the last week at home is me trying to stay away from the man I love yeah. as much as possible because he's right now sunning his buns in Cuba. Lucky bugger. He, yeah, well, I mean, he's been wanting to go south for a while now, and uh, this year he had a chance to go, and he has been working very, very, very hard. Uh, and he's been accomplishing a lot of things, including uh, able to uh, find some lab space to continue some experiments, which was, uh, you know, and funding, which has been uh, some some major work mm -hmm. uh, in order to secure that and uh, getting his uh, manuscript into a publisher so that he can hopefully have his article published and all of that. So he was 
pushing on all those fronts at the same time while trying to teach his classes and all that kind of stuff and uh, and taking some training to become a better teacher. Mm -hmm. So he's been working on a lot of fronts all at once. So uh, he deserves this vacation. So it was like when it started about Sunday, it's like, yeah, I'm masking in the house and I'm either sleeping in the other room or I'm sleeping with the mask on when we sleep. So, cause you are not getting this cause you are taking that damn vacation cause you have earned it. So it was a rather lonely week because, you know, we tend to be quite physically affectionate with each other as you see when he comes on the show, you know, every now and then and or just to say goodbye. So keeping distance from someone you love when you know you're not going to see them for a week is very, very hard. But I did it. He didn't catch the cold. Uh, but I don't know if this was just a regular cold or something else because, it, as you can hear, mm -hmm. I'm still congested, but at least my voice is not three octaves lower now. It's not Darth Vader voice. And I've had some appetite come back because I've been living essentially on soup and toast. So, And yesterday I actually ate meat. So um, I think I might be turning a curve, turning a corner. Not quite fully there yet, but uh, I've also, you know, had to miss a whole week of rehearsals. So yesterday I was sending apology letters to the cast of both shows going like, I'm so sorry. Because when you're not there, it's tougher on the rest of the cast, right? They're doing that to work or they're filling in without you there. Or, you know, you've got lines and they're not playing against you. Or in the case of a musical, you're someone's dance partner. And, uh, well, that's not happening. So, um I was feeling bad. I mean, we, we opened one show on the, on the eighth. So this is kind of bad time to be away for a full week as you're, you're getting to the final stretch. Mm. So, um, I'm hoping that things are on the, the other end because, uh, my friends have been telling me that there's this thing that's going around that can last up to three weeks with people and I can't oh, be out for three weeks. Um, but uh, today is the first, uh, th this morning is the first morning in seven days that I'm actually breathing through my nose without the help of decon being hopped up on tons of decongestants to start the day. Well, that's a step in the right direction. I yeah. Guess, yeah. We'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> but mm. hey, no dark feather voice. And I'm eating, you know, beyond soup and toast. And I can actually breathe through both nostrils at the same time. Compared to the last seven or eight days, that's a win. Uh, I, yeah, I would say so. Yeah. I am still tired as F, though. I am wiped. I think you might be able to hear it in my voice and see it in my face. I'm a little, uh, a little ragged. But politics doesn't stop and the world doesn't stop. So I've been uh, trying to keep up. Yeah, I think the more I'm going to be um, vertical rather than horizontal, the more it's going to. <laughs> mm. I feel my nose starting to snuff up <laughs> as we're talking. <laughs> um, but the show goes on, and there has been a lot. I am going to start with some uh, lighter news, and, uh, okay. and then things are going to get Dark. Uh, a, a little darker darker unfortunately today um but the scotty's tournaments of hearts uh has ended and we have a new canadian championship team anderson uh which was the team that was affected by brianne harris being declared ineligible just it seems hours before the first match and we still do not have an explanation as to why that is from curling canada um i'm starting to wonder if maybe it might be brianne harris herself that asked to keep it confidential and it wasn't curling Canada who are trying to be cryptic specifically. Uh, cause I saw an interview with the new uh, CEO of uh, curling Canada and he was trying to do his best to say something to give us an idea, but he was like, but he was like, that's, that's, I, I, that's all I can say. Uh, so it seems that maybe, um, this is not a proactive decision from Curling Canada, but it may be something that either came uh, from the player uh, involved and everybody thought it would be a good idea to respect that privacy or something. Mm -hmm. So, which would eliminate the possibility in my mind if we're using deductive reason, but that's just speculation that it would be something performance related or performance enhancing related. 
Um, so, but we, but we still don't know. Um, so they, uh, you know, they did very, very well having to, uh, deal with the curveball. And, you know, as we saw with the Canadian women's soccer team, it's kind of hard to be at your best when something like that is thrown your way. Uh, but they still did make the playoffs, but they, they did, uh, lose and, uh, they will not defend their championship for the fifth time, uh, of the top six teams. You know, when uh, Devin Haru put it out, that tweet says, okay, okay, Manitoba, we get it. You're good at curling. All four Manitoba teams qualified for the playoffs the oh, wow. the, among the top six. So, uh, yeah, Manitoba is really at curling. Uh, we had some great matches, but the final did come down to uh, Jennifer Jones, often regarded as being the greatest of all time. She not? Yeah, she, uh, retiring. she's retiring from the four-person game, but she'll still be playing mixed doubles with her, mm. her husband. But she's uh, retiring to uh, concentrate more time uh, with family. And uh, but she's given 22 years to the sport. So uh, at this level, so you know, she's got two world championships, two world Olympic appearances, including one where she got the gold medal. I believe that was Sochi. Um, she's been Canadian champion six times, which is the record tied with Colleen Jones. So, um, you know, she's had a, a very good career. And, uh, and then Rachel Homan from Ottawa, of course. Yeah, mm-hmm. curling club and uh she went through the entire round robin perfect and she won the final and everything else so uh the team went through the whole tournament undefeated to win and they had to beat jennifer jones i think three times over the course of the, <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> the tournament in order to do to do that because i think they were in the i'm not sure if they were for some reason i think were they in the same I can't remember off the top of my head now, but let's assume they were in the same pool for the round robin and then uh, in the the playoffs, the way that it's designed is that uh, some teams play and you know there's a there's play to get to go directly to the final and then uh, there's more play uh, you know everybody gets about a, a chance or two to try and get there. so it gets <laughs> to be sort of like double knockout at that time. So uh, yeah. It's her second undefeated uh, Scotties for Rachel Homan. So, uh, and uh, she had one game during the tournament where she played 100%, and then the very next game, 99%. So, um, is that not normal? I don't know. Uh, well, I mean, she's normally very, very good, but you know, scoring 100%, having a perfect game on all your shots is, is pretty rare. Oh, okay. So, so almost to do it twice. No, I, I thought you meant when you said played 100%, I thought you meant she played the entire match and didn't bow out at any point. No, no, she made all her, all her hits, all her draws, every like exactly where has planned on the button, you know, and yeah. so uh, it, it was an amazing display. It really was an amazing display. It, uh, both teams played well. It was very entertaining curling though match the, the what they call the the one point one versus two page playoff which is sort of like a semi-final but not exactly the semi-final um was probably the most intense curling match uh yeah, anyone seen in a team. very long time um, just incredible incredible shot making so it's uh there you go She's ah, got a car heart zone. <laughs> hello 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 I can't hear a thing though. See my big girl pants. I'm wearing my big girl pants. <laughs> covered with paint, and uh, they're not the sexiest thing I've ever worn. Um, they work. <laughs> they're very comfortable. There's room for a whole pass to dinner in here. <laughs> uh, my wife. Uh... <laughs> so yeah. Uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful tournament. Uh, the people who watched got treated to, to some of the best uh, curling out there, and uh, you know the the top eight teams in Canada and ranking were part of the top sixteen for that tournament. So uh, very, very good. And the men's tournament uh, starts on uh, Friday, and uh, there are the top seven teams of Canada will be there among the the top sixteen. So it's going to be a, quite a quite a tournament. And cool. the the women's world championships are going to be in. A, um, uh, in Sydney, I believe, this year, Nova, uh, Nova Scotia. So um, good luck to everyone. Uh, it's uh, Rachel Holman's fourth Canadian championship as well. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, proven champions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Definitely proven champions. So uh, that was good. And then, um, sorry, I'm a... 
I'm gonna have to take over for. Are you verklempt? He, he's verklempt. I believe he's gonna have a sneezing fit right now. That's okay. I, I had one the other day. I sneezed seven times in a row. Then I was horribly dizzy afterwards. Oh, my ear just popped. Oh, that that hurt. That's not pleasant. I don't know why that did that, but you know, sometimes things like that happen. Woo! Sorry about that. That's uh, kids. And uh, over the course of the weekend, um, a young Canadian lady who is, I believe, 19, only 19, makes his, made history as the youngest world champion in women's skeleton racing. Yeah, Canadian woman. Uh, I saw yes. That. Hallie Clark is the new world champion of women's skeleton. And she's the youngest person to claim the title. She won the junior world championship on the same track last year. She posted a four run combined time of three minutes, 51.27 seconds to win the world title. And which is really the most interesting part is that Clark failed to reach the podium in any world cup event this season mm -hmm. and came out of nowhere when the whole, whole to become thing. world champion. Yeah. How cool that. is I thought, that? I thought, yeah, having a dismal season and then wins the whole damn thing in the end. How damn cool is that? So uh, congratulations to you, young lady. Very, very, very well done. Just, again, I with you know swimming the other day and then the, short, uh, the long single-distance speed skating championships, and now Skelton, we're just like picking up world champions left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. Lots to be proud of. Lots to be proud of. So there you go. Uh, and I believe there was uh, also at um, the World uh, Under 3, uh, I'd have to look it up again, but the World Under 23 Cross-Country Skiing Championships, I believe Canada picked up two gold medals there too a couple of weekends ago. So it's just, um, I have no idea what it is at all, at all, at all, at all. But uh, there's something in the water when it comes to Canadian athletes this year. Lots of hard work, it's paying off. But it's uh, it, it's nice to have things to celebrate. So congratulations to uh, everyone that's having good results, and and there's good results all over the place. Our golfers are killing it. Uh, you know, Adam Hadwin finished fourth in a tournament uh, somewhere recently. Brooke Henderson finished ninth on the weekend. Another top ten. Stephen Names won a tournament on the Champions Tour last week. I mean, it's just we have some tennis players. Uh, ben uh, Benjamin uh, Sigway won a doubles tournament somewhere. Just people, Canadians are winning stuff, are just winning stuff left, right, and center. It's just lovely to lovely to see it. That uh, you know, when people want to try to make us believe that we're broken, uh, no, we're not broken. We're not. We're not. We're out there and we're accomplishing great things. Speaking of broken, yes. And how about somebody intentionally trying to break something? For those of you who haven't seen it yet, I have the tweet from um are we talking about ma parker here yeah all right let's let's give a little lead up just before dropping it okay let's just drop it <laughs> well, <it's on> the <laughs> all he's right. going to be on dean's show today yeah so i don't you might want to tune in for that i don't i don't know why how, how do i put it i don't know i understand that we need to try to talk mm -hmm. to these people. Um, I don't know. In one way, I don't understand why they come on our shows. Yeah, because we're not going to be kind to them. <laughs> I guess, but I understand that, um, you know, for them, oh, love. Uh, I understand that for them, you know, any opportunity is any opportunity. So, you mm -hmm. know, they'll take it visibly at all costs, I'm guessing. I think um, that's largely what it is, yes. I don't know why uh, we have them on ours either, other than obviously it's you know it's going to be good ratings and it's mm -hmm. going to be... Um, it's topical. But yes, yeah, it's current. topical and current. So um, I'll, let me read this out. So but for, yes. for the folks who are listening in, David Parker on, was this Saturday, I believe, tweeted this out. And I quote... I feel sorry for Anita Paul. Anita? Anita? Is it Anita? Anita, Anita. I believe. Anita. Okay. I feel sorry for Anita Polyev. She, uh, she has to watch her husband spend hundreds of hours a month with his old friends with benefits. 
I'm sorry your husband doesn't give you the respect you deserve, Anita. No man should be spending that much time with a woman he used to sleep with, if he is married. Okay. Uh, Wow. So, as I understand it, Danielle Smith has set up an office here in Ottawa because she wants to be closer to, I don't know what, she's the premier of a province. She's in provincial politics, not federal. Why is she setting up an office here? Other than she wants to ascend to the throne of leader of the opposition party? Is that what it is? Is she going to leave the United Conservative Party in the province of Alberta and join the federal Conservative Party? Well, uh, here's... take it over? This is well, what that was, is. Yeah, the, well, that was my, my thought too, people, because people saw that and they said, ooh, ew, why is this happening? Exactly. Uh, Kit James, P- David Parker sharing that, and the people who covered him sharing that are a big problem in the media and politics today. It's tabloid shit. Yeah, it is tabloid shit, but uh, it also is. Um, some guy who is calling himself a political assassin mm-hmm. who claims uh, that he ended the careers of O'Toole, well, Shear, I should say, uh, and ended the career of Kenny, and then there's another person he claims to end the career of um, whether he did or not, he's publicly taking credit for it. Um, and uh, he's coming out against the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, seemingly out of the blue. Mm-hmm. Now, we speculated on our show twice now, on the first day, that uh, Pierre Poliev, after three days with the media, trying to do everything he could to avoid talking about Danielle Smith's transgender guidelines, finally caving. Mm -hmm. And sort of saying that he, well, not sort of saying, saying that he supported banning puberty blockers until puberty, which of course makes them... Until 18, yeah. yeah, Puberty Completely useless. (laughs) Useless whatsoever. Um, And then... They kept asking him, and then over the course of two other days, he kept on going a little more in and a little more in. And at the end of the first day, we said, ah, there we go. He just conceded the mantle of the leadership of the Canadian Conservative movement to Daniel Smith. Mm -hmm. Then came Theo Mudax's cartoon with Daniel Smith as Dr. Evil and Pierre Mm -hmm. as as her mini-me. And she's saying, I call him Mm mini-me. And then after he comes out saying that he's also, you know, uh going to do or planning on some type of digital id check to get onto porn sites and talking about safe spaces and start talking about washrooms and stuff so basically skippy went to talking about housing almost every day and affordability issues and now he seems to be focused on what people do with their genitals mm-hmm Essentially, we've gone from focus on genitalia. I don't don't remember the last time PP did an announcement on housing or talked about housing because he couldn't shut up about it for the longest time. But now he seems to be talking about other things, stolen cars. He's got to keep changing the story. I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying he seems to have been knocked off message on the other stuff. And it just seems to me that with all of that, maybe David Parker is sensing that Podiev is weak. Mm-hmm. Podiev is weak uh, because he's got 19 months to go. And if he's already focused on genitalia with 19 months to go and has cried himself out on housing and affordability, uh, maybe what a lot of people are saying that he won't last until the election is one thing, or if he does that, you know, eventually time is not his friend and he will not win. So it looks like David Parker either doing one of two things, sensing that Pierre is weak and wanting to take him out so that he can, yes, perhaps place Danielle, as the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, which is or maybe he, he himself, because he does have a bit of a messianic complex. 
Yes, Donna, to answer your question, he is the take back Alberta guy. Yeah. So w- what's his angle here? It's not stated for the moment. Um, but the first thing that popped to mind is, well, yes, if PP so capitulated on the transgender stuff from not wanting to say something to now seemingly be obsessed with it, and he's agreeing all in with Danielle's policies, then all of a sudden, yeah, it does look like Danielle is the leader of the Canadian conservative movement, not Pierre anymore, because he's dancing to the tune that she is calling. And if he is that weak, well, there we go. So uh, going after Jenny Byrne, uh, yes, it is true that Pierre Poyev and Jenny Byrne used to date. Mm-hmm. At one point in the day, in the days of Harper, and uh, she is still working on his campaign. Something I too found always a little strange, yes. you know, especially now that he's married, that he would keep the ex so close. Uh, but then again, uh, conservatives do have a reputation as being uh, the people that will do anything and accept anything for a win. There is that. So, you know, it, it's not necessarily abnormal in that sense uh, you know they'll let nothing distract you from the primary objective however you know but then again as you're we're saying you know there's a lot of people wondering how real is that marriage between Pierre Polyev and Anaida Polyev because there are rumors of some long-standing stuff about rumors. long-standing rumors about Polyev to whether or not he is um, plays for the other team entirely heterosexual let's put it that way that's a fair one um i have nothing one way or another because i've seen some speculation stuff i've seen some rumor stuff um you know again there's been some tweets saying that ask pierre about his former intern that you've uh, seen going around Mm -hmm. But I have nothing corroborating that. And no, nor, nor do I. But uh, so there's well, something not, I'm going to speak to about that to find out a little bit more yeah. information. But I like what James has to say here, and I agree. It feels personal with Parker, not strategic. First, it is a bad strategy to say that in public. Second, there's no upside except feeling giddy for spreading a rumor. It's like this is not political messaging. This is like deeply personal. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. This seems very, very deeply personal. And uh, more evidence that it's deeply personal uh, is right here because that was not the only tweet he had. Okay, this is kind of funny. (laughs) Yes, indeed. If we're being honest, Pierre's punching well above his weight class with Anna. She's a seven. He's a pocket calculator. (laughs) Indeed. But we also have uh, this one here. Mm -hmm. Jenny Byrne, you're going to have to blow that up, sir. Uh, can't so, take, whoops. Can't quite see it. That's what I was trying I to do for some reason, but that wasn't quite. I'll pull it down until you can get it fixed. You're having, having a technical yeah, glitch I, there, I, I it will. seems. There we go. I can't seem to get the, the image and uh, the text blown up as much as you want. But. Yeah. This, like, I mean, this is, he's he did this recently with uh, Rachel Notley something similar he's like oh look it's jenny the loser alcoholic remember in the 2015 war room when you day drank all day and harper wanted to fire you i remember that's from david parker that's really personal yeah not only is that really personal it's like dude you're that's that's as in the ditch as it gets if she has an alcohol problem i hope she can get some help but why are you attacking her that's just, that's just garbage. Now, you see, but, and he, he likes to say, well, I was uh, an alcoholic years ago and now I'm reformed and I'm great now. So you feel that gives you the right to pick on somebody who may or may not have a problem with alcohol. Is that what you're saying? Because mm-hmm. that's not cool. No. See, now I have to admit, Kits, I am conflicted. I know. Yeah. Because, um... It's not like Jenny Byrne has been the nicest person <laughs> on the political scene. Agreed. So there's a little, um, here's a taste of your own medicine. Here's a spoonful of medicine. No sugar. How's it taste? 
Yeah. And, well, petty is my favorite color. <laughs> so there's part of me, yeah, as a kid James says, Jenny Burton is Canada's Carl Rowe. I agree That's with that. not necessarily unhappy that mm-hmm. the children are fighting. No, I know. I, I agree with you. Fight. I'm like, you know, fight. The, fight. Yeah. Fight. Go fight. ahead and eat, fight. Fight. eat each other's fight. faces, you know, because yeah. you're all terrible people and you're all going to suffer the consequences for your terribleness. But I, I, same token, to, at the yes. same token, this is really uh, exactly. filthy. Uh, and I'm kind of loving that how they can't stand each other mm-hmm. at all. I want to take each other down. It's, but. Putting out rumors that someone's husband is banging the ex and then bring out mm-hmm. personal information about their addictions or potential addictions, because it's not like I don't think it's she's ever been on the record as saying that she's had a problem and has been trying to uh, address it, like Seamus O'Regan Jr., for example. Uh, so yeah i'm not quite sure how i feel about this but i'm not in if i'm being completely honest i am not entirely sad although i am eyes as big as toonies that this is like actually happening because there's 19 months to go yeah it's like the next election is a while, a while away. And we thought, you know, that these two movements would work in tandem in order to get rid of Trudeau, but it seems they can't stand each other more than they can't stand Trudeau. And I'm thinking that maybe David Parker, again, seeing some weakness from the PP camp, is seeing an opportunity, and hey, you know what, if we can get rid of this guy before the next election rather than after the next election cycle... Why not? Because, I mean, his whole thing is taking people down and slipping in the people he wants. So creating a crisis within the Conservative Party of Canada, oh, we need someone right now. Ah, by God. Well, here's someone, Mm -hmm. may I suggest. And then, you know, that I mean, that's how how we got Doug Ford, right? Patrick Brown was cruising to it, and then somebody did him dirty, took him down, and all of a sudden it's like, hey, guys, I'm Doug Ford. Remember me? Yes, and nobody and asked him any questions, and he just got in there. And now look what they all he's doing. It's just, uh, it was a bit of a shock to see that. I mean, I, I was shocked, but not shocked, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Like, I'm like, wow, that's really heavy duty. But um, at the same time, yeah, kind of expected. Kind well, of yeah. Expected. I mean, that's, as we keep on saying the show. One thing you can set your watch to when you're in a movement that is purely ideological, at some point, count on it, someone is going to come along and say, hey, the current ideologue is not ideological enough. Either I or here is someone who really is a true believer. And then everybody takes another step to the left. Or in the case, the right, another step to the right. And we go closer to the polar extremes. But that's always, it was the same with the separatist movement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They just keep going too far and people are like, whoa, hold on now. (laughs) But when somebody's not having the success they counted on, somebody turns around and says, hey, he's Mm -hmm. not a true enough believer. We need to apply that purity test. So David Parker either has his hands up someone else's back because he likes to be puppet master or has his hands up hers. Maybe he promised her that she would be PM someday. Mm. Stick with me, kid. I made you premier. I'll make you PM. Maybe he's got someone else in mind. Maybe he's got himself in mind. So I don't know what the play is, but clearly the play is that the the Conservative Party of Canada movement and the UCP movement are not united and not necessarily rowing in the same direction and are not necessarily focused on the same objectives. And I'm not sure that Pee saw coming that the call would come from inside the house. (laughs) 
Now, this is not unexpected in the sense that PP has had a very, very, very terrible, no good, bad week. Yeah. Well, right? you saw the letter. Did I send, did I show you the letter that was sent? Somebody well, sent yeah, the letter. Yes. Somebody sent a letter as well. And it's um, well documented. That yes. We, there's we, a lot we, going on there. We will, we will get to that. So you have this David Parker doing this thing. And one of the reasons that this has happened is because, um, well, Pierre Poliev, first of all, after better part of two years railing against the concept of digital ID. Mm -hmm. Now wants digital ID. <laughs> right. <laughs> is talking about age verification to access porn sites, which we talked on a previous show. Is I think most sensible and reasonable Canadians would agree that we should be doing something mm -hmm. to try to restrict the access of young Canadians to porn given that it's available everywhere. Everywhere, all the time. Literally everywhere. Right? The problem is not, should we do it? Because I'm pretty much sure everyone agrees on that. It's, how do we do it? And conservative MP Karen Vecchio is presenting in the, the House of Commons a bill that started, uh, I believe, in 2021 in the Senate. So it's Bill S-210 which is now uh, had first reading in the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. And it's a bill to try and restrict access to online porn. And the thing is, is that the bill keeps on telling, well, it's actually in the House of Commons, it's a motion, I believe, um, and not an actual bill. Um, I have to look that up again just to be absolutely sure. But I believe it is uh, indeed a motion. So... motions can't have dollar signs attached to it. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's very, very important. Neither can private members bills. Um, but it seems that what's being discussed in the house is more about that. We should do this and has absolutely nothing in it at all about the how. So PP decided to run with this when the prime minister was talking about the online harms bill, which is going to be introduced fairly soon. Now, the online harms bill is a bill from the federal government because um, they've been talking about this for a while. And they believe that the, you know, the internet can be a dangerous place, but it's not specifically focused on access to porn it's it's broader it's a broader bill so it is talking um about stuff like um terrorism content the sharing unauthorized sharing of intimate images uh, it's talking about hate speech online mm -hmm. stuff like that there are five categories in all. And uh, for some reason, I'm, I'm looking for it while I'm speaking, and I can't seem to find it because I was going to do that later on the show, and I'm looking for it now, and I can't find it. But it has five categories of stuff. And the problem is, is that PP had to come out in opposition to it right away because the five categories of stuff being addressed in the online harms bill are things that his base would not want restricted in any way. Mm -hmm. Would not because he needs those things. If there are consequences for promoting hate speech online, well, that doesn't make the stands in his base very, very, very happy. Now, does it? If there is a ban on sharing of intimate images, well, given all the work that he put into 
is MGTOW hashtags, we know that that is something that probably wouldn't go over very well with the base that he's courting. Given that we just had a decision in Ontario court that yes, white nationalists can be terrorists, as it pertained to that man who drove his truck up onto the sidewalk and took out nine-tenths of a Muslim family. Well, sharing of terrorist or stochastic terrorist type content, again, is something that the free speechers probably wouldn't want any curbs on or limits on. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's not like he can come out in support of the online harms bill. And he's already come out opposed to it. Before he's even seen it. Because it hasn't been tabled yet. Just like he's come out opposed to the farmer care bill, which hasn't been tabled yet. And so is Alberta. Alberta saying they're going to opt out, but they want full compensation without even seeing what's in it, because it hasn't been tabled. In fact, when PP was asked about the online online harms bill, he then came out, that's the day that he made his comment about uh, Trudeau having spent half of his life as an active racist. Yeah. That, and then talked that, about blackface again. That was... I can't believe that a man that's, you know, something like, I can't believe the man that spent half his life as a as an act of racist is, can be taken seriously on wanting to prevent online harms and blah, 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 when it's the conservatives that keep on spreading the blackface photos, which I'm sure makes the black committee community super happy every time they see it. Um, It's just, so he acted, um, but, but it's, you know, he acted like a petulant child. You know, what about the arm online harms bill? And then he says, well, Trudeau blackface. Ah, and then he, yeah. I guess he grabbed on to S12 and said, well, you know, like this, uh, I'm going to, we're going to talk about online, high, online harms. Let's talk about children's access to porn. I'm going to ask for age verification check without thinking that the next natural follow-up question was going to be, okay, how are you going to accomplish that? Uh, um, I, um, uh, digital ID, the thing that I've just said. We can't. The last two years, I can't support. So now he's Aaron, Aaron O'Toole flip flopping, mm-hmm. Aaron O'Toole style flip flopping on digital ID. And he, Aaron O'Toole flip flopped on not wanting to talk about trans issues to going all in on them, adopting Daniel Smith's policy. And there's also Ukraine. Yeah. On the second anniversary of Vladimir Putler's invasion of Ukraine, well, he went out to an event and talked to the Ukrainian people and put out a tweet saying that this time he said Canadians. will always yeah. stand with Ukraine. He, he, Normally he, he says a conservatives. Uh, he always says conservatives. They always do. They never talk about Canada as a united country. They're always conservatives setting themselves apart. So he actually came out in support of Ukraine and Zelensky and said Canadians. I'm like, did somebody else, somebody take his Twitter machine away from him? Because that's well, not typical for him. So the, this is the tweet here. My message to the Ukrainian community rallying today in Hamilton and across the country. Canada stands with the Ukrainian people fighting for their freedom against Vladimir Putin's war of terror. Now, here's the thing. He normally says conservatives will stand with Ukraine. So, And we know, we've established on the show many times, that conservatives consider themselves conservative first Mm -hmm. and then Canadian. So I don't know if by saying that strategically, he's excluding himself. He's saying Canada stands with Ukraine because we sure as hell don't. (laughs) Maybe. Maybe. And he's posturing and posing. But um, the PP stands, the Canada first crowd, Trump Mm -hmm. imitating Canada first crowd, really did not like that. 
No, they went hard on him for that one. Oh yeah. Like they were they, they just, went for the throat. They were not having it. When I uh looked at it, the very first three tweets, Mr. Grizzly, that I saw mm. at the time. The very, very first three, this screen cap here is the first three tweets I saw under Pierre's tweet when he tweeted that. And this is how they went. Just pull it up here. Okay. I need to blow that up if you can. Oh. It was about the max I got. Mm. Yeah. Pierre, if you want my vote, you need to listen to your constituents. Most of us don't support our tax dollars going to Ukraine. It's time to call for peace talks. No more money. Peace talks only. I wonder if that guy or that person whose handle is Despise Trudeau, Jamie Schmidt 6, I wonder if that person actually lives in his constituency. The next one from Shadow, the Shadow Davis Show. Dude, stop talking about Ukraine. The only thing we care about is not having any more of our money sent there. The third uh, tweet in response. Andre Arthur. Dear Mr. Polyev, I like you. You seem to be an intelligent and reasonable man, and I agree with you on a lot of issues. But you see, this statement you wrote right here is exactly the reason why I'll give my vote to Maxim Bernier. Those were the first three. Mm -hmm. Those were the first three. Yeah. Um, and it just went on, went on, went on, on, on like this. So people seeing see him flip-flopping Aaron O'Toole style also on Ukraine. Now, whether or not he said Canada so as to try and give himself some plausible deniability, I said, well, Canada will stand. I never said I would when he goes and talks to them and then try to make it seem to moderate conservatives who don't necessarily watch all his rallies that he's, you know, he would stand by them. That's one thing. But here's the other thing with that one. It's, after voting no mm -hmm. on a free trade deal that Ukraine itself asked for. That he tried to create a carbon tax issue out of when there was no such thing. He blatantly lied about it. Yep. Blatantly lied about it. And after They've had a carbon tax since 2011, I believe. Yes. And after courting for months, the whole... Canada first faction mm -hmm. that doesn't want us to put another cent into Ukraine on the second anniversary of the invasion he goes into a pool of Ukrainian, Ukrainian Canadians to beg them for their votes mm -hmm. claiming or trying to create the illusion at least that he stands with them now this reminds me of another event when he showed up at that Hanukkah Mm -hmm. candle lighting ceremony event in Montreal because he had planned a fundraiser nearby and he wanted to get out of his telethon, I mean votathon <laughs> that he had in the House of Commons. And he went to that lighting ceremony on the same damn day he had already voted or was Against about to vote or was about to vote no to funding a Holocaust museum in Montreal in a Jewish community center in Vancouver. So he votes no in the house to certain things. And then he goes among those ethnic communities mm -hmm. and tells them that he stands with them to beg for their votes. That's it. Bibi has a nasty little habit of using people. Well, uh, how many times has he said he's going to do something for housing when he's actually voted against it every single time? Yep. So he shows up for the photo op. He shows up at the rally in Hamilton and shows up at the menorah lighting ceremony, but systematically votes against them in the House of Commons when he matters. And on the day of the menorah lighting votes, it is actually technically possible that while he was there at the ceremony itself, something came up on his phone and said, hey, time to vote, and he voted no while he was there. I mean, that's literally how duplicitous is. I'm not saying that that's how it happened because I don't know when the timing of the votes is. Mm -hmm. I guess. But it was on the same day. 
Oh yes. He could have he could have voted no earlier and gone there and done it anyway. He could have gone there with the intent on voting no and the vote hadn't happened yet and, and the vote could have happened while he was there so, because he did vote. His votes are recorded. So now he's used the Jewish community and he's used the Ukrainian community which tweeted uh, which prompted Dean to tweet Putin's Canada pool boy, Pierre Polyev, begging Canadian, Canadian Ukrainian, sorry, begging for Canadian Ukrainian votes three weeks after voting to let Ukraine starve and die is pretty fucking gross. And I couldn't agree more. It is pretty damn gross. But then again, so is Canada's, Putin's Canada's pool boy. Mm. He's pretty gross. I don't know what it is for you, but for me, between voting for the man who stood with Ukraine from day one or voting for the man who voted against upgraded free trade while courting those who want to stop aid then claims he stands with Ukraine to beg for his votes, if we're filing this under don't vote for assholes, I mm -hmm. think that the choice imposes itself. And to create the contrast moment, Mr. Grizzly, while Pierre Podiev was in Hamilton, trying to pretend to Ukraine Canadians that he's got their back, even though he voted against them every step of the way in the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. uh, the Prime Minister. Yeah, he was in Kiev with uh, Zelensky, Vladimir Zelensky. You have it right here. There we go. At this critical time, Canada's support for Ukraine and for the Ukrainian people remains unwavering. That was the message, message I shared with President Zelensky earlier when he and I sat down in Kyiv. So, I haven't heard much from Maxim Bernier. No. I haven't actually gone to his Twitter feed to go check, but I would guess that he is a very, very happy man after the end of this week. Because he now has some openings. Mm -hmm. Pierre has to pick a lane whether or not he's for or with you, you for or against Ukraine. And I think it was uh, Charles Adler that was on Dean's show. He said he has two questions for Pierre Polyev. And uh, one of them is, who are you with? Yeah. And if he was a journalist, he would keep asking that. Who are you with? Yeah. Because right now it seems that even within the movement, he can't tell. Pierre is trying to have it both ways. He's trying to play all sides. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, as Lauren Hill sang in her song, That Thing, that was the sin that did Jezebel in. If Pierre is trying to take the Aaron O'Toole route, trying to still maintain that PPC vote while trying to appear like a moderate option for just disaffected voters who are tired of Trudeau and want change. Um, there's a whole wing within that movement that's ready to take him down for not being pure enough. And if they are already marking him 19 months before election day as not being pure enough and already trying to take him down, he already has to fight on two fronts. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not it's, sure how he gets through the next 19 months. Uh, he's not going to be able to because now he's got to deal with the pharmacare issue, which just, you know, came up over the weekend as well. Yes, he needs to take a position on that too. Yeah. <laughs> and Alberta has already said, we're out. Yeah. Yeah, because they don't care about, um, you know, the 21% of Canadians that have no insurance when it comes to pharma pharmacological products 21 percent of canadians do not have any insurance when it comes to you know medication you have to pay right out of your own pocket but pierre says well most people the majority of canadians have coverage yeah 70 69 percent or 79 percent do 79 percent do but the 21 percent who don't are young or seniors and that's the other thing when you retire you don't have coverage anymore and usually when do you need the most medication usually in your later years so 
he's saying basically, remember his party was the one who changed the, re the retirement age to 67 from 65 and, and decreased funding for seniors. And now they don't want you to have any insurance program whatsoever. You'll have to pay out of pocket for your medications that you tend to need more of as you age because your body starts slowly breaking down. They just don't give a shit about you. They don't care. And the leopards eating people's faces party are eating each other's faces right now. Yeah. And he's, he's, he's getting it on all fronts. He's getting it on all fronts. So again, in my famous words that a lot of kids seem to enjoy when I say it, mm -hmm. fight, fight, fight. Fight, 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 fight. Pull his hair, gouge his eyes out. Cat fight. Do it, do it, do it. Take each other down. Seriously. And here, I found it. The five areas where the online harms bill plan wants to act. Content that incites violence. Well, gee, we could see how the convoy crowd would be opposed to restricting content that incites violence now, yeah. can we? Mm -hmm. The non-consensual sharing of intimate images. Because the MGTOW crowd really loves that revenge porn. So we can't have that. Child exploitation. Well... It's not like Pierre is not trying to appeal to those religious communities that still believe in child marriage. Yeah. So he can't be against that. Hate speech. Uh, I think we're pretty clear that he can't oppose that as well. Particularly from religious communities who like to hate on gay people and use scripture to do it. And terrorist content. While his whole convoy crowd is trying to make the Kutz Fuhrer look like political prisoners. So, let's act on porn. Yes. And the thing is, is that a lot of people ha have bitten at this. See, you know, I'm glad he brought up the subject. Yeah, he brought up the subject on we should do it, but he didn't propose a how. There's going to be an arm lines harms bill. Trudeau blackface. We should act on porn. Save the children. How do you propose to do that, Mr. Polyev? Uh, 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 uh. No plan. Blackface. Yeah. Yeah, that's all he's got. He has no plan. And we have a lot of people getting themselves worked up about a Senate bill that's being discussed as a motion in the House of Commons that there is going to be no legislation on this. Mm -hmm. There's ultimately going to be no legislation on this. PP won't introduce it himself. Of course not. Because if he does, he's going to have to propose a how. Oh, digital ID. Oh. Well, here's the thing. Is there a how? I honestly don't know. Think about it. Is there a how? Is there a manner, an actual manner, if we get out of the world of should, Should we protect children from accessing? Yes, we should. How do we do it in a manner that's constitutional, that doesn't open a back door for people to be blackmailed, for people that we don't trust to distribute their content in a manner that children can't access? being trusted with people's personal information. Is there an actual way to do that? 
Mm. And again, I'm not the most tech savvy person, so I don't know. But it seems to me that that would be quite difficult to do. So while, how do we put it? Pointing to something we all agree we sh should be done to not talk about something that is actually being done, but without coming with a solution as to how we get it done, in politics is pretty much a useless, info, useless conversation. Because how do we do, everything that comes down to how do we do it? In the end, so, it's not like that bill's going to come from him. So he needed something to distract for the second. And that's what he went to. But now he's being asked some very, 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 very inconvenient questions. And it's not just me that's, that's wondering it. Here, because I posted with regard to this. The problem is that a politician has not offered an ID yet to help, keyword, with this mm -hmm. issue. A politician has used this issue as a pretext to offer an idea, a very bad idea, that would create a dangerous precedent to chip away at privacy rights. So if there is a solution, CPC, digital ID, is not it. And none other than Mark Burry, who is a lawyer, who we very much respect, mm -hmm. said, not sure it's solvable. He's one of the better legal minds in this country. Yes. And he's not sure that there's a legislative solution. I don't know how you can come for up an with age it. check no. to access a porn site. So you have somebody that's once again playing on the fears, the legitimate fears and concerns of parents, just as is being done with the trans issue. Reasonable adults of course, are concerned with at what age kids can access these services. And since a lot of them are not the parents of trans children, they never thought for more than three seconds about, well, if it had to be done, how it would be done. They're just like, should it be done? No. Again, we're in the should. Should kids under 18 have access to bottom surgery? No. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations, they don't. Yeah, it's not a thing. Most people don't know that, though, already. So the should debate is being presented as it's something that's happening. Oh, let's protect the children. Let's pass this new law to ban that which is already not happening. And let's paint the medical community and teachers as being evil people trying to corrupt your children. In the process to play on your emotions and get you to open up your wallet. On this case, should children be having easy access to porn? No, would say most reasonable people. And most people are right to be concerned about that. But there's no digital solution. At least one that's constitutional and can be applied. But get mad and open up your wallet. But while we're talking about that, hopefully we won't be talking about other stuff. Mm -hmm. So again, it worked in the nanosecond. But what's going to happen with all these people that have bought into the concept that, yeah, we should be doing something or waiting for something from Polyev to stop it, and it never comes? That's why I'm saying it's, uh, David Parker might be spelling blood in the water. I, I think he is. I think he is. And it, it's, you know, he's, he's going to go for the throat while he can. Um, I mean, the one thing about that man that you have to, I won't say respect, but acknowledge, is that he seems to know when to swoop in. Mm -hmm. Well, he's an opportunist. Yeah. But he has, well, exactly, but he has the, 
as we say in French, le pif. He has the smell mm -hmm. for when it is that it's time to come in and uh, swipe someone's leg. Sweep the leg. Sweep the leg. Whoosh, so, That's a Karate Kid reference for those of you who didn't know it, the movie from the 80s, Ralph Malkiel. You can check it out online. <laughs> yeah. So. Well. Uh, yeah. Now, again, there's lots of stuff going in the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not paying attention this to that This episode right now. is not about the porn stuff. This episode is about using the porn stuff to try to deflect from other stuff and the strategically leaving yourself with an open flank. Like, like this from Michael Deatter. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> it's a cartoon where two uh, women are in the bathroom doing their, their makeup going, there's no place for the, no place for the state in the bathroom of the nation. And Pierre Olivier, Pierre Olivier is sitting on a stall eating apples. Yes. With a bunch of apple cores on the, <laughs> on the floor. Um, there's also no place for the state in the spank bank sessions of the nation as well. Oh, very complex issue. Oh, uh, have you seen, uh, Pierre Polyev had another makeover recently. Have you seen it? I'll put it on the screen. Oh, here right not really? Yeah, there it is. It's yes, most everyone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know who, who that kind of looks like a little bit is Hassan Minaj. Oh. Okay. A little yes, bit. Yes. Yes. Got the five o'clock shadow and the beard and the square jaw and and the the rippling. It's an AI of of Pierre Polyev shaking hands in the gray gray t shirt photo that has been heavily doctored already. So uh, for yes. those of you listening, it's, it's and and uh, then someone you did a, an AI one of David Parker the other day. Oh, I that, haven't seen uh, that. Yeah, I wish I could find it off the top of my head. Uh, that looks remarkably a lot like Max Fawcett, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> so David Parker went to went to someone's hairstylist or whatnot, and you know had his you know, his beard trimmed down and whatnot, and then you're looking at it, and it's like, is that like an AI mashup of Max Fawcett and David Parker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in order to create what a real man looks like. So I'm sure De <laughs> David Parker probably didn't <laughs> like that one either. Um, so yeah, the kids are fighting. I'm not exactly uh, unpleased about it. Uh, they're using... Um, they're using Jenny Byrne. Mm-hmm and things in Pierre's past and things in her past to do it. Um, it is completely below the belt. Um, rumor, innuendo, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, live by the sword, die by the sword, because this is their stock and trade. So, I mean, they really can't be surprised that they'd be using it against each other. Mm -hmm. But yes, Yes, the big news is that there seems to be a schism within the conservative movement. And we're seeing that in a lot of places, right? We're seeing it in New Brunswick. The more progressive conservatives that have left the party as uh, Blaine Higgs is going uh, very much evangelical and Christian fundamentalist in terms of recruiting his, uh, his uh, new candidates to replace the incumbents that no longer want to run for him. And now we're seeing it at uh, the federal provincial level here, where there seems to be a split. And ironically enough, we're also seeing it on the left with the NDP. We're seeing a lot of pardoned NDP parties provincially that are uh, trying to dissociate themselves from the federal party yeah, as much as possible. And on the left, well, there is a whole other reason for it. And that's because, once again, Jagmeet Singh did the stupid thing. Yeah, he tried to... I saw that yesterday, and I'm like, oh, dude, why do you keep doing this? Yes, so we wondered... We wondered... Um, 
Oh, darn. That's not good. Let me try this again. I'm trying to share a link with uh, I have it. Mr. Grizzly. I'm not sure if that leads there. Yeah, the link's there. Okay. Um, we wondered. His, his wording here is just, I'm going to put I know. it on the screen. I know. Right I, I know. We I just, wondered. Now that. Oops, that's the wrong one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now that uh, Jagmeet Singh has got his dental care and his anti scab legislation and the beginnings of a pharmacare program, which he himself is saying is uh, going to be transformational, would he now finally start to speak of his partners, the liberals, as being people that helped, or would he still borrow from the Pierre Polyev playbook? And which is exactly well, what he did. He's still borrowing from the Polyev playbook. Mr. Grizzly, please read the tweet. After tense negotiations with the big pharma-backed liberals, we secured the first step towards an NDP national pharma care program plan by covering birth control and diabetes medication. This means you will get the medicine you need with your health card, not a credit card. And if you would like to play uh, the, the video? video thing, okay. it lasts 54 seconds, and he does so well until about second 37. Here we go. I'm standing in front of the Banting Institute. This is where insulin was invented here in Canada. And the inventor sold the patent for insulin for a dollar because it was supposed to be a gift to the world. Well, now people are still spending thousands of dollars on their diabetes medication. It should not be like that. That's why we want universal pharmacare for all, so that people don't have to worry about the cost of their medication. We want to save people's health and save people money and save our healthcare system. And we can do all those things by giving people access to universal pharmacare. We want to start with contraceptives and diabetic medication, and we want to go from there and expand to cover everybody for all their needs. We can do this. That's what New Democrats believe in. But we're up against liberals who continue to be out of touch, to drag their feet and make promises and then break them, and conservatives who are too close to big pharma and are not going to ever make this happen. You can count on us. We're going to keep on fighting. New Democrats have your back. I'm standing in front of the Banting. He was doing so well. He was doing so well. And yeah. then he had to go to the gutter. And, and, and the worst part is it's the partnership with the Liberal Party, the supply and, and, and uh, what is it? Supply confidence and, and supply agreement. Thank you. Confidence and supply agreement. It's because of that agreement they're able to make this happen. Because on their own, the NDP does not have enough seats or enough power to do a damn thing at all. So he just threw the party under the bus that made this happen. Again. Oh, what the fuck is wrong with you? I've never met a man be so (laughs) incapable to graciously take a win. Sorry, well, Donald Trump was like that. But graciously take a win. I don't get it at all. And... You have it all over the web at Trevor's Ideas. Singh should just take the win and show what the NDP can accomplish in a minority. I think a lot of Canadians want to see a cooperative alternative to the CPC. The quote, I force the Liberals to do something against their will routine doesn't ring true and ignores the fights to come. Canadians in the provinces haven't accepted Pharmacare yet. The hearts and minds battle has just started. It would be a lot more helpful for the NDP and LPC to present a united front here. NDP needs to pick a common lane Need to pick a lane on pharmacare. Another, Cecilia Naismith. My opinion of Singh rose when they made the announcement, then when he bogarted all the credit and insulted his partners in the effort, my opinion sank lower than it had been previously. Time thief. Singh's cheap shots ate at the Liberals' misrepresentation of facts and gaslighting were the reasons I left the NDP after decades of being a member. His ego-driven communications team are sounding his death knell as a leader. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Yeah, it, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> People are not liking this. No, he's he's destroying the party from within. This this is not. You know, he he went on recently about how Ed Broadbent was his his mentor. I'm like, well, Ed Broadbent would never pull a stunt like that. It's, I just don't understand what he's doing. And, and, and Jay Kirk here, zigzag jag, he can't pick a single lane. I think that's what we should call him now. I know it's jug meat is how it's pronounced, but zigzag jag because of the way it's written. 
I said, Jug Meat, bro, bro, seriously, stop. Stop this this partisan crap. And you you're doing partisan politics with a bipartisan agreement. Do, do you not see how stupid that is? You're, you're, you're patting him on the back while you're stabbing him in the back at the same time. It happened because of the supply and confidence agreement you have with the Liberal Party. I don't know who the comms people are who's writing this, but if you're trying to torpedo the party, you're doing a darn good job of it. Right? And... See, the thing is, I'm not understanding with him, is that Canadians elected, right? Mm -hmm. Canadians elected a minority parliament. It's for a reason. Yes. Just days ago, for nearly a week, Jagmeet Singh was everywhere he could be in the press, claiming the Supply and Confidence Agreement was on the brink because those big, bad liberals were once again trying not to make Pharmacare happen. Meanwhile, the MP appointed by the NDP to be the point person on this file for the purposes of negotiating with the Liberals has been claiming, and has claimed all along, that good progress was being made. Then all of a sudden, if we were to believe Mr. Singh's earlier pronouncements, a deal was struck. One so good, if we are to believe Mr. Singh's current pronouncements, that it lays the groundwork for something revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And though we voted in a minority parliament because we wanted cooperation and Mr. Singh allegedly heard us because he struck the confidence and supply agreement with Trudeau early on, for which he received much praise at the time. And from it, he got his pharmacare deal as well as his dental care deal as well as anti-scab legislation as well as a whole bunch of other things that were in that deal. The man categorically refuses to run on the fruit of that cooperation. Why do all that work for two years to then get your results and then not run on them? Why is he not running on more of this cooperation in the future? Instead, it's, the legal liberals are bad and terrible and they weren't going to do it and we dragged them into it, kicking and screaming. We forced it. Yay, us. We did this. Alone. But you didn't. It would have never gotten done had we not forced them. I say, why does this man keep lying when the truth, cooperation creates better things, will do? That's a lane you can run on. I don't get it. Where is the strategy? Why have all this cooperation that we saw happen only to lie? that cooperation didn't happen. This type of inconsistency led Max Fawcett from the National Observer to tweet, Jagmeet Singh is the Pierre Polyev of Tom Mulcares. Ow. Yeah. yeah. That's brutal. Yeah. Espe I saw that and I chuckled. I thought, well, that's, that's good. That's good. It's especially brutal when you consider that Tom Mulcair is the lawyer who didn't know enough to know when to quit in a defamation case in which he was accused mm -hmm. and lost. He was ruled in court as being an intentional liar who would say anything about another, as Singh has apparently chosen to do frequently as a go-to strategy here. Yeah. I just... Uh, Jug meat, jug meat, jug meat, jug meat. Why? 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 What's wrong with you, man? I swear. And I wish I could find it off the top of my head here. Um, but Charlie Angus yesterday, or maybe it was maybe not yesterday, but when the deal came out, actually posted something with regard to this agreement. And it's sort of like, hopefully I'll be able to find it. But it's like, why couldn't Jagmeet Singh say this? Mm -hmm. It was beautifully written. And it had the tone of cooperation. 
So there's somebody in his party mm -hmm. <laughs> that can do it. But for some reason, nope, nope, not, not Jug Mead. He just, he, he will not. He cannot, he cannot be gracious. He is all in on this strategy that he is the guy that forces the liberals to do things they wouldn't do otherwise that we would have none of this if it weren't for him. And I'm not saying that he doesn't play a role here. Clearly, he played a very key role. Mm -hmm. This was something that was not on the liberals' agenda to begin with. But we now have a policy that's about to go to the House of Commons where Canadians who require insulin are going to get it and their testing supplies full coverage and women who need birth control not only for birth control but for many of the other mm -hmm. ailments for which it's prescribed it's not it's not just for birth control it's... exactly we'll also be able to get it this is a big win and apparently it's a framework legislation mm -hmm just as Medicare was a framework legislation, just like the cannabis legislation was a framework legislation. So it's a sound legislation. We don't know what's in it yet. It hasn't been tabled, but this kind of stuff has worked before. And it's just... He could run on this. Like, uh, there's a guy on a Twitter at John C. Roscoe. Put it the most eloquent way. I've seen it yet. It's like we each get just so many bricks and we can either use them up building walls or we can use them to make bridges. Mr. Singh is satisfied to pile a rambling berm and lob the remainder over the top in hopes of beaning someone important. Pretty much it. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Exhausting. Another. Pharmacare deal done. This is where the NDP excels, saying they got things done and then leaving others to actually do the work. Ouch. Take the W, man. Yeah, exactly. In PC bio, I've never seen someone try so hard not to take the W. You worked together. You got things done. Cooperation works. One person tweeted, you know, as Pierre was dividing stuff, as David Parker, David Parker tweet came out. This, some uh, guy, um, I think, uh, Graham F. 31, I believe is his name, said, like, while you guys are tearing us, tearing, tearing yourselves apart, our side is uniting to make things happen. Putting the, the announcement of the Pharmacare deal right under David Parker's tweet. This is this beautiful one, two, one on top of each other that was just fantastic. And then, whoops, out comes Singh, just saying, you know what? We're going to take the whole credit on that, just like we did with dental. And it didn't work for him on dental care. Didn't work for him on dental care. He didn't get good press from doing that. No. But yet, he just keeps shooting himself in the foot. I don't get it. I just, yeah. I do not understand it. Ugh. Mr. Grizzly, have you got something? Got a couple of different things here that... Um, a couple of different things, and I'm not sure which direction to go in. There's the most horrible thing I've ever uh, read, well, so far this week. But I don't really want to discuss it because it's really, it's really brutally bad. Something that took place in Washington, D.C. yesterday, and the response by police um, was to put a gun on a man who was self-immolating. Oh, yes. And that's as far as I'm going to go with that story. It's really horrible. 
uh, there's footage of it. I'm not even going to look. Uh, it just... Uh, yeah, I think it has something to do with the Israel-Palestine thing, right? Yes, the Gaza. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's available. You can find it online. The story's there. It's been written about. It's pretty horrible. The man has succumbed to his injuries and has has died as a result. And I'll just kind of leave that there. It's it's a it's a big story and it's pretty terrible. Right. You have anything else? I have uh, this from Theo that I think I'll show you because this is a lighthearted thing that uh, is funny and uh, made me smile. This is the uh, latest um, political cartoon. And it is uh, uh, multi-panel. Voting intentions unchanged since last election. Pierre Polyev, virtual reality headset. Wow. The closest Polyev will ever get to be being PM. Virtual reality. That's hopefully that is the case because I shudder to think of of uh, that. That's from twenty twenty three. That one, by the way, I shudder to think of what would happen if he ever became prime minister. Uh, and I mean that the, the the guy flip flops on everything to just try and win the the nanosecond. And I mean, he's already come out against the pharmacare program. He's come out against the ten dollar a day daycare. He's come out against the housing. He's voted for every against every single thing that would help Canadians from middle class down. He's voted against all of them repeatedly. And his voting record is available for you to see. It's public record. And people still want to have this man as prime minister. I, I think it's because, and, and tell me what you think about this, sir. I think it's because the people who are firmly in his camp, hate a certain group of people. They realize that he will do harm to them, but they're like, those people will get harmed more than I'll get harmed. And I think that's the thinking here. I think that's the thinking because I don't understand why anybody who is informed in any way, shape, or form would vote for such a person as him. Because he does not have your best interests in mind. He does not want to govern. He wants to rule over you. And, and James, yes, I do agree. Um, it's leader fatigue, Trudeau fatigue, regi regime fatigue that people tend to believe Polyev may be the next prime minister. And that's entirely possible. But I hope there's enough Canadians that have a sober second thought and realize this guy is going to be really bad for the country. I don't know. We've got a long ways to go. And it looks like David Parker's trying to bring the man down. So will he even be, and you're right, that they wouldn't be voting in Pierre Polyev, they'd be voting out Justin Trudeau. But is Polyev going to be there by come next election? I honestly don't believe he will be. He's lasted in the position longer than I expected to, him to. I can't see him there for October of 2025. I just, I can't see it. I, I, I can't see it happening. I don't think PNC Bio is saying that uh, liberals may change leaders sometime in the fall or early winter 2025. I honestly don't see that happening. It may, but I don't see it happening because as, as we saw on Ryan Jesperson's show last week, uh, the prime minister very much wants to lead the party into the next election. Now, does he step down after that? Who, who knows? I, you know, but he's, he's bound and determined to do what he can to try and make the country a better place. And this hateful venom spewing that Polyev does on the daily is really beginning to, to rub people the wrong way. As I've said time and time again, 2024 is the year of pushback. We're starting to see it in the media. They're pushing back on his lies and calling them out for them to his face. Finally, I don't know what took so long. Thanks for getting here, even if it did take you forever. So we'll see. We'll see what's going to happen. I, I don't think Polyev will be the conservative leader come next election. Uh, the party might just emulate itself at the way they're going. It's entirely possible. Hmm. What yeah. happens between now and October of 2025, I don't know. Nobody does. But I don't think he'll be in position. I don't think uh, Polyev will be the official 
leader of the loyal opposition. I really don't. I think the party will bring him down because he just keeps going madly off in all directions. One minute he supports Ukraine, the next minute he doesn't. One minute he looks like he's supporting Vladimir Putin, the next minute he doesn't. He's voted against housing programs. He's voted against child care, pharmacare, dental care. He wants to raise the retirement age to 67 again. He wants to cut benefits for the elderly. This is not a good person. All he's going to do is enrich his donor class, wealthy friends that keep him there. And <clears throat> something that I've talked about in the past, and I can't get into the details on it, but Polyev is against green energy. He's come out against green energy many times and renewables, much like Daniel Smith has in Alberta, the province that was leading the country in renewable energy, by the way. Yep. And there is uh, some very, very powerful people in this country who run some very powerful organizations that are all in on green energy. I can't tell you anything more than that. I'm privy to some information, but they are all in on green energy. And if you're not on their side when it comes to green energy, you will not be prime minister. You won't be. These are powerful people. I'm, I, these are the people who get people into that position. They've done it before. They'll do it again. They are powerful people. And if they want Justin Trudeau to be the next prime minister, he will be. Because they'll go all in on green. And I can't tell you anything more than that. But if, if Polyev keeps touting oil, 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 no to green energy and denies climate change, he's finished as a politician in this country. Because the powerful people that I know about who are all in on green are walking away from oil and fossil fuels altogether. And these are the people who, who get people in, into that position. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave it at that. All right. All right. Um, I did, no, uh, green tech doesn't decide elections, James, you're correct. But the company that is going in on green tech, they do. These are powerful people. I can't tell you anything more than that. But if they want somebody in that position, they get them there. They've done it time and time and time again over the last 50 years. There you go. All right, Mr. Grizzly, this is, uh, yeah, green tech is where the smart money is going. Yes. So this was the tweet that I thought was uh, brilliant uh, from F31 Graham. Because he had got the David Parker tweet right behind it. You've got Graham going, while your movement divides, ours comes together. Breaking news, liberals and NDP reach deal on pharmacare. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was uh, really brilliant. And I did find the Charlie Angus thing. Uh, and again, when we say about when we're talking about Jagmeet Singh, again, JB, who we had the, on the show mm -hmm. the other day. Welcome to the NDP post, Jack Layton. Ship without a lighthouse sometimes. We have Evan Scrimshaw. I haven't read Again. it yet, but I've got it. Yeah, like this, which um, hopefully I'll, I'll have a chance to read that into a, a little later. Um, but here, with Charlie Angus, he wrote, Canada is finally on, this is what Jugmeet Singh could have said, but chose not to. Mm -hmm. But someone in his party did. Charlie Angus was also mm -hmm. vying to become the leader back in the day. Canada is finally on track to implementing a national pharmacare strategy. The negotiations for this historical accord were a make-or-break moment in the agreement between the New Democratic Party and the Liberal government. There were many moments when it seemed both sides were too far apart to continue working together. In fact, we were forced to give an ultimatum that if pro progress wasn't made by March 1st, we were going to end our agreement with the Liberals. Fortunately, this determination kept both sides at the table. Details of what the plan will look like will be released soon, but I want to assure you that the agreement is rooted in the principle of a single-user national pharmacare plan that respects the Canada Health Act. We insisted the government follow the recommendations of the Hoskins report that have shown that pharmacological care will improve health for millions while saving the system billions. 
The full implementation will take some time, and this is why the New Democrats insisted that as a sign of good faith, the Liberals move quickly on coverage for diabetes medication and access to contraceptives. For people with diabetes, this will be an accord that will be a life changer. While New Democrats were focused on implementing pharmacare, Pierre Polyev is ratcheting up the rhetoric in his rage and blame style politics. His latest campaign is to target trans kids using women's washrooms. This is shameful, but also classic Polyev. I have known the man for 20 years, and in all that time, I have never seen any vision or commitment beyond gotcha moments and political arson. Polyev's team is trying to prove to Canadians that our nation is broken. This means reducing parliamentary debate to the level of gong show stupidity. It means blocking legislation, tying up committees, and trying to block any legislative moves that will benefit the Canadian people. Meanwhile, New Democrats have been focused on making this parliament deliver. In addition to national pharmacare, we have pushed the government to move on a national dental care strategy, sustainable jobs legislation that puts workers at the table of the energy transition, investments to aid a clear energy revolution, 10 days paid sick, 10 days paid sick days for workers under federal jurisdiction, anti-scab legislation, support for accessible national child care, and $8.3 billion to address First Nations community housing crisis. It's about showing up for work and to make lives better for Canadians, and we still have much more to do. We're in this together. Charlie. Mm. Why couldn't have Jack Meet Singh written that? I don't know. Because that's literally what happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jack Meet Singh keeps on sailing past every signpost towards statesmanship. He 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 has it and then he just sails off past it. I I don't know. I don't know why. He just continues to do it. Then we have Evan Scrimshaw. And I love this from uh from him. Jagmeet Singh's pharma poison. The week Rachel Notley was elected as a premier of Alberta has always stuck in my mind for a variety of reasons. It was the week my grandfather died. It was the week I did mock trial at the Ottawa courthouse with my high school. It was the week David Cameron won a shock majority government. As the massive nerd I was then and remain to this day, the existence of two interesting elections was a blessing. It gave me something to focus on that wasn't the crushing blow of losing a man I loved deeply. At the funeral this Friday morning, there was only one eulogy. It lasted less than a minute and used the fact that both the eulogy giver and my grandfather had played in a charity golf tournament with Jean Beliveau as some sort of full circle moment. I genuinely wish I was making this up, but I'm not. It was completely the wrong tone for the event, and yet none of us were particularly surprised. It's the only thing I can think of when I see what Jagmeet Singh posted today calling the Liberals Big Pharma backed and saying that he is up against the Liberals to deliver pharmacare. On the morning it's officially revealed there is a deal between the Liberals and NDP on the policy. He has won and is continuing to throw punches like he's being blocked. He's lying to the Canadian public because he's both saying the Liberals are about to do this big thing that justifies voting for their continued existence, while also saying they're frogs who won't do anything. As a strategy, it's insane because all it's doing is pissing off soft liberal NDP switchers who like pharmacare and dislike you shitting on them without winning you any votes from people you don't like who don't like this liberal government. As a statement of truth, it's disinformation, which is allegedly a thing the NDP and the broader left are supposed to give a shit about. And it's clearly not working because despite 59% of Canadians saying it's definitely time for a new government in this morning's abacus, the NDP are only up a point since 2021 nationally and would probably lose seats if that poll was borne out eyeballing the regionals. So what's this all for? It's not for the people who will now get insulin and contraceptives covered under the scheme, because if you actually cared about the issue, you'd be holding a joint press conference extolling the virtue of the liberal government. If it's about political advantage for the NDP, you'd have never signed a deal with the liberals in the first place, because any deal instantly jeopardized a dozen NDP MPs in places where the liberal brand is about as popular as drinking one's own piss. See why the NDP are about to get wiped out in non-Vancouver and Victoria, B.C. And if it's about the political advantage for the broad left, then Jagmeet would be spending his time attacking the conservatives. But it's not about any of that because that's not what the modern NDP is about. The unsaid truth of Canadian politics right now is that people in every party but the NDP keep asking each other when Jagmeet is going to be replaced. Everyone, whether it's liberals or Tories or even the few blockists I know, is convinced that the NDP's decision to keep this sanctimonious fool in this job is a disaster. 
and yet they won't fucking do anything because for some reason it's uncouth to say anything mean about them. I have respected people in the NDP, tacitly admit I'm probably right about Jagmeet, but because of the language I use about him, they won't countenance sharing my virus columns saying so in public or share it with others in the party. I'd say it's a cult, but at least cults have a proper understanding of what they're trying to achieve. So let's have an honest conversation right now, in the safe space that is the one and only site, sorry, in the, the safe space that is one of the only sites that will properly air this out. What in the name of fuck is the point of the NDP if they can't take a win without shitting on the liberals? Getting the liberals to a firm place on Pharmacare is a legitimate accomplishment that will do a lot of good if they manage to get any provinces on board before Polyev wins, which is uh, uncertain. I'm supportive of that goal, and I'm glad that the NDP exists as a vehicle to push liberals left. Once again, I voted NDP in 2021. This, is, this criticism is not coming from some true anon nutbag, but from someone who last voted liberal in 2015. I want the left to govern this country and all its component parts. It's why I want the NDP to win in the four western provinces and why I would have voted for Olivia Chow in Toronto despite generally hating her approach to politics from when she was an MP. Chow has rapidly surpassed all expectations I had for her, mostly because she's willing to deal in a way I was worried she wouldn't be. But instead of following the lead of the successful NDP politicians of this area, we have Jug Mead pretending that everything is fine as everything crumbles around him. The NDP under Jug Mead are a national embarrassment. We have NDP ministers in BC having to reprimand their federal leaders' understanding of housing issues. We have the Alberta NDP considering some form of disaffiliation because his leadership is toxic there. We have the Alberta and Saski energy critics decrying a federal NDP private member's bill. And all of this happens for no electoral benefit. If the NDP were at 26%, would this uselessness of a leadership be worth it? Sure, and I'd probably support it because it would at least mean there was a discernible purpose for all the dumbassery of the Singh leadership. It's pretty clear from my view of Chow that I'm willing to tolerate a lot to get to the broad policy suite I support. If you're able to stop CPC MPs from winning, or in Chow's place, a mayoral candidate who hired Dick Kovalis, I will tolerate a lot. But he's doing all of this in the name of still getting fucked. The NDP can credibly claim they've achieved some good this parliament, but at the end of the day, they're lying to themselves if they think the damage they will sustain for it has worth it. Had they made electoral reform their line in the sand, this deal would have been worth it. But by accepting the damage of formal deal making without MP, without mixed member proportional or single transfer vote, the NDP are stuck in no man's land. They're taking all of this damage on their culturally sorry. They're taking all of this damage on their culturally conservative working class flank, flank, losing places like Comox and Courtney and Kootenay and Skeena, all for the potential of maybe you take Danvernport off the Liberals, which at the end of the day doesn't really matter. Chakmeet Singh is at the end of the day a failure and a fraud. He's as tone deaf as my terrible uncle when he gave that fucking eulogy, but the worst part is he's such a joke that just like how nobody was surprised that the eulogy was shit, nobody's surprised now when he makes an ass out of himself. He is actively harming the causes he pretends to care about. He is lying to the Canadian people on a near daily basis. He is everything a politician shouldn't be, masquerading as a hero he'll never be. Ouch. Mm. Agmeet's time has been up for the last three years now, but today's stunt just makes it ever clearer. Singh is a cancer on Canadian politics and our country's governance, and until he's removed, we will all suffer for his presence. That's pretty succinct. And I think that under, uh, that uh, the way that ended uh, pretty much validates his earlier claim about um, while some people in the NDP tacitly agree with his assessment with Singh, they're never going to share his writings <laughs> um, <laughs> because of the bam, right in your face way that he, uh, he writes it. But it's true. I, again, as someone who's a calm strategist, where's the strategy? Mm-hmm. I just don't see it. No, I just, just um, don't see it at all. All right. Um, um, I, I, you know how I've said time and time again on this show that I'm wondering about Polyev's health. Because, okay. well, I mean, I question it. I seriously question it. And here's why. I'm looking at a video of him from the video clip from March of 2020. Well, we're conservatives. We don't believe in big government spending programs. It's only four years ago. He looks like he's age 15 years in that time frame. 
I, I, I wonder if he's, I wonder if he's ill and I mean that and out of concern for a fellow human being and one who has children, I think his politics are just horrible, but I, it's, I don't know, man, uh, the guy, I, he, he doesn't look well. He doesn't look well at all. All right. Um, there's one thing uh, going on in the chat here that I've noticed, and I just want to to make uh, a point here. Mm -hmm. um, Kit James said something with regard to Polyev, and I think some kids in the chat may have misunderstood it. He wrote, PP's trajectory for a politician is the best in the country right now. He's not going anywhere because he doesn't necessarily agree mm -hmm. with you that he won't see his way through the next election. And uh, to which uh, um, Kit Dan uh, wrote, James, let's have a live discussion about PP is a fucking loser, and you know it. Both statements are true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We know both, both PP is a loser. Yeah. I'm sure Kit James is quite aware of how much of a loser PP is. The point is not about whether PP has the stuff or deserves to be the leader. It's what's his trajectory. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I, PP literally has a golden, like if you were talking about a plane and you need to get the emergency slide down mm -hmm. to the ground, he's got a golden emergency slide right to the prime minister's position right now. Mm -hmm. He's got a three term government. Going for a fourth one, which very rarely happens, with someone very rarely. for whom there's leader fatigue, for someone who's taken on a lot of shit that he shouldn't have to, but because he's getting punched in the teeth for having taken measures to have kept us whole and safe during COVID. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and let's not forget the whole mis and disinformation program about who's responsible for what level of government. And you know, yes, but the, the national civic and, Yeah. Featuring a con facing a confluence of world events that are unenviable for any leader, wars that raise shipping costs, mm -hmm. rising climate stuff, and emerging from a global pandemic where everything had to be shut down, we had to take on a lot of debt in order to get through. Right? And he's got a press that is very servile willing to torque anything and twist anything mm -hmm. they're willing to have 100,000 conversations about when is Trudeau leaving where was Trudeau at Christmas but not ask the same questions you know the funny thing about that is is the amount of uh, garbage I will read online when they when they will ask a, you know they'll ask those questions when is he leaving people don't like him blah 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 then they'll print a good story like pharmacare for an example see it's the liberal owned press Oh my God. Yes. Yes. The press loves Justin Trudeau, which is why they print six stories a day about when they think he should step down. They love him that much. People, if you think he's got the press in his pocket, give your head a shake, put down the bong water, stop drinking it. Because if you actually believe the press is actively supporting and pushing for prime minister, Justin Trudeau, you're fucking high. Yeah. So it's just, I want you to understand, kids, it's not that Kit James is being a contrarian saying that PP is great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's saying he's got the best path. Yes, and it's true. And we don't even deny it. We, we agree. Objectively, he's got the, he's, he's the he one with the easiest path. And he keeps on trying to torch it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's got 19 months to go. And our position is that time is not his friend. The more you get to know him, the more you loathe him. And that this shtick that he's doing can't last another 19 months. No, it won't. I guess, and now he's getting into the, the part where people are starting to ask him how. Or he needs to fill the space with more. Right? When the liberals started making the announcements on housing, we called it on the show that this was brilliant. Bypassing the provinces mm -hmm. was brilliant. Because there are way more municipalities than there are provinces. Which means multiple announcements mm -hmm. jb was on the show posted on the 23rd 
says this is 14 days in a row that Sean Fraser or the Prime Minister has made an announcement on housing of some kind. Yes. There's a reason PP is not talking about housing anymore. He's been crowded off the turf. Yeah, absolutely has. Because he has nothing new to say other than build more dense residential around transit places and I'm going to punish cities financially for not doing housing the way I want. Yeah, that's that's what you want as a leader. <laughs> he literally has nothing else and bad-mouthing mayors. He's literally got nothing else. He's got uh, nothing else. James wanted to see if we could say something positive about Pierre Polyev. Okay, I'll give you one. He has a really good comms team. That's as close as I can get to saying anything positive about him. He has a really good comms team. That is objectively true. The only positive thing I can say about him is that there was a time that he was a very, very, very good constituency MP. Oh, was he? Yeah. When he yeah, first that's got... why he kept on getting elected for the last six years, yeah. six terms. Yeah, that, that's why he's been coasting the first, I think, two or three terms. He really, really worked. Okay. His constituency. I mean, you have to understand, this man has one legislative accomplishment in 20 years. Yeah. He's attempted, he sponsored only six bills in 20 years, only one of which got passed, which was his Elections Reform Act, which got his party tanked. Yes. Eventually. So in 20 years of service, you know, he keeps on saying after eight years of Justin Trudeau, after 20 years of Pierre Poliev, he's done we nothing. have one bill that passed. That's it. And brought his party. That's all he's accomplished. So he had to have been doing something else over the last, those last 20 years. So yes, the first few terms, he was a very, very, very good constituency MP. You can hear it from everyone like this. And mm -hmm. That's why now he never has to work. He just gets, because people are, he's still coasting on those fumes. That's why you got this Bruce uh, Fanjoy guy. I guess who you keep on seeing on Twitter, like this every day, just going door knocking, door knocking, door knocking, mm -hmm. door knocking, two years ahead of it, three years ahead of it doing all the groundwork because he needs to convince people because he knows that that's baked in. He knows it's baked in. Pierre was at one time a very, very, very good constituency MP. But he's been coasting for the last few years for sure. Yep, absolutely. All right, Mr. Good for you, sir. That you yeah, I have a clip for you. And um, this is the part where I said it's uh, going to get dark. <clears throat> Oh, I know what this is about. Yes. Uh, this yes. is from um, our friend. Um, yes, our Nate friend, Pike. Uh, Nate Pike. At, from the Breakdown, uh, Alberta. Yeah, from the Breakdown. Um, you need to watch this episode, Kits, uh, particularly if you're from Alberta, because he does open uh, on the health care thing. Uh, and he works he's completely. Yes. He's completely beside himself that uh, the UCP is already on the record as saying that they want to opt out but they, they want to opt out with compensation, the thing that Quebec often does, right? They're saying, like, he's basically saying, you guys could even manage to buy Tylenol. Well, now you want us to give you the money to manage people's mm -hmm. coverage for insulin contraceptives? Y y yeah, no. Um, but the thing about this show is the way that it ended. Uh, Kids and Cups, uh, the last caller. Uh, Oh, I got to put the sound on here. We've been saying uh, for a couple of uh, weeks now that Danielle Smith's transgender guidelines thing, that's not even a bill yet because she plans to introduce it in uh, September, uh, would result in blood on hands. Let's have a look. If you want to weigh in at towards the end, by all means, please do. But we have a new speaker tonight, and I actually was in the background uh, sending a message. No, please get them to come back. So I want to make sure that I give them the the space to uh, to 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 say whatever it is that they want to say because I received a message saying that this person did have some things that they wanted to raise. So all of that being said, I'm very excited to welcome to the show. I believe Dr. David Keegan. How are you doing tonight, sir? And this is where we do the, the first timer thing where I say, you got to hit the little unmute thing on the bottom left-hand corner of your device. Perfect. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. How are you doing, sir? Uh, okay, I guess. Okay. Well, that's restrained. 
Um, let's, ex- let's, let's find out why. I got a message saying that you had some things that you wanted to share. I believe, I mean, it's been a, a breakneck day at the, the breakdown here today, but I believe that you were a speaker at an event in Edmonton. Um, and so I'm going to open up the, the floor and it's all yours. Hi. So thanks very much. It's, it's late. Um, and it's been a horrible two days. Uh, the short version is two nights ago, two members of the Calgary police service came to my home and asked to come inside and speak with me. And that's when I learned that my trans nephew had died by suicide. Um, as a rational person, as a just a, a person in our world, and also as a family doc, I sort of figured and thought there's a reasonable chance that these horrible policies that were unveiled in that disgusting video uh, by Premier Smith probably didn't help. And yesterday, I learned that they not just didn't help, that they were a contributing cause. Uh, that my trans nephew uh, had been worried for quite some time and actually had messaged me in the past about concerns about the growing trans hate in the United States and in Canada, but that specifically he was very um, scared and felt quite isolated as a direct result of Premier Daniel Smith's uh, um, unveiling of her planned policies. And so I'm, I'm from Calgary, uh, also known as McKinsey's, the uh, traditional territories of the people of the Blackfoot Confederacy, as well as the Maiden Nation of Alberta, Region 3, and near the people, the Good Stony people. Um, I'm in Edmonton now, though, uh, because I have to go clear out the, my, my nephew's place, I have to work with the Edmonton Police Service, uh, the medical examiner's office, and so on uh, to navigate the, 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 the death by suicide of my nephew. And uh, so you said earlier, I'm sorry I wasn't able to hear the whole thing. It's just been a very uh, challenging day and challenging weekend and challenging time. Uh, and. But I heard you say earlier, you know, it's only a matter of time before kids get harmed from as a result of Daniel Smith. Are you still there, Dr. Keegan? Sorry, I'm back again. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry, my phone just went to the homepage thing. Sorry, and then that shut it off. Sorry about that. So, uh, um, so anyway, so I'm here to clear out his apartment. Uh, the reason he's dead, well, it's complex, but a, con- a direct contributing factor was the announcement by Premier Smith. And so you said earlier in the show, it's only a matter of time before some people die as a result or sorry, get hurt as a result of uh, uh, her policies that she unveiled. And uh, my nephew was 37, so not a kid or teen anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, But still, we now have at least one person's death, (sighs) which we can directly draw a line to, to Premier Smith and the kind of hate that she and Pierre Polyev and their ilk are promoting. I also blame or think other people are accountable are all of those, every single UCP MLA who's sitting in caucus, who was quite happy to let their leader choose hate, choose cruelty. Because remember, it was something like 10 years ago or so when she stood up as a member of the Wild Rose Party Mm -hmm. and talked about the need actually to protect and provide opportunities for people who are trans. And uh, she took a libertarian uh, framework or perspective on it, as I recall. And yet here she is now spewing hate, pretending to care when actually unveiling a horrible series of things which are setting back not just trans rights, but actually the rights of children to learn about their own 
bodies and sexual health is the most regressive set of such policies any of us have seen in Canada. Sadly, they're not the most regressive in the world, but boy, they're trying to get there. Um, and this was all deliberate. She's not ignorant. She knew 10 years ago what the right thing was. She's chosen cruelty. She knows and knew that people would be harmed, that people would die. And now she's got what she planned. There's no way a premier can unveil that set of things, the, that set of restrictions and prejudices and pretend to know or pretend to think that people won't get hurt. She knew this was going to happen. She knew it. And all I'm doing is just saying she got what she planned. My nephew's death. I'm so sorry, sir. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that so many people have said. Uh, and I think that it's so critically important to highlight that as much as these policies specifically target um, kids and youth, the, the rhetoric that's being leveled is absolutely harmful to anybody uh, who is trans or has trans family members or cares about trans people as human beings. Um, we saw, we heard from... Um, Marnie Panis about the the threats and the hate that she's experienced since Smith announced these policies. And I think you're absolutely right, sir. I think that um, there's no intelligent argument to be made that Daniel Smith could not have seen this coming and that she chose to do it anyways because she's got a leadership review and she's more concerned about saving her own political skin than the literal skin. Of... You know, actually, I, I don't even know if it's even that. This is 100% about control is that we have a premier who is just quite happy to control others. She says she's a libertarian, she's not. It's the opposite. A true libertarian would say, you do you. Trans people, fine, don't, like, you live your life. But no, so maybe it's about a leadership review, I have no idea. All I know is that the premier of our province, the leader of our province, and the UCP MLAs were all sitting there and allowing her to have that title. They are fully 100% on board with choosing cruelty, choosing death to stay in power, to accrue power, to control people. They like the control. They, uh, they seem to like the cruelty because every single one of them knew this was going to happen. Every single one of them. There's no and it's not just them. It's also, you know, the premier of New Brunswick. Happily, he had a, a revolt. The premier of Saskatchewan <clears throat> and his caucus and Pierre Polyev and his caucus. All, every single one of those elected people who all happen to be, you know, a conservative or conservative aligned party, um, every single one of them is just fine with exactly what their leaders are saying, which is exactly opposite to freedom. It's all about control. You're not wrong, sir. Um, I want to, I got a couple things that I want to throw in there and then I'm going to give you as much space to say whatever else you want to say. Wow. Pretty heavy duty. A 37 year old trans person took their own life because they couldn't deal with what was going on. Um, I wonder, I wonder I wonder if we can get Dean to ask David Parker later today how he feels about that and how he'll dance around answering that question. Because this is Parker pushing her to do this shit. She went from being a libertarian, we have to support trans people, to now she wants to control them. That is David Parker. So I blame him. I hold him responsible. That's my personal opinion. There. Yeah. Kid James uh, raises the issue. I don't know if we can say that she wanted the death. 
rather than saying she proposes that Smith didn't do, doesn't feel responsible for any deaths. Um, I can't give that latitude. No, I can't give that latitude. When you introduce that type of policy, you know that that can happen. And if you go ahead with it anyway, um, I don't know how you go ahead with it, with it anyway and say you don't want that outcome. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm not saying that she woke up that morning and saying, you know, I want trans people to kill themselves and this is how I'm going to accomplish it. Yeah, I don't think it was a conscious thought like that. Well, after all, PP's her puppet was. and she's Parker's puppet. I hope it wasn't that. But I don't think it was. It, but as the point was brought out when she was talking about the bill, she said, you know, in the cases where there are some parents that don't do right by their children, you know, we have the law and all that kind of stuff. And somebody made the point, yeah, she's proposing that this will be something there after the children get hurt. Yeah, how's that helping? But nothing to prevent them from getting hurt in the first place. Um, that was introduced in a way such that there was nothing offered as support to the community who might have been felt abandoned as a, as a result. And that was the starting premise for all of it was that parents, all parents love their children. And in the case where they don't, well, we have other stuff for that. And was rather cavalier. To say the least. About the possibility that something would happen. So I can understand how someone can turn around and say, well, it's not like she wanted it, but it's not like she wasn't aware that it could happen. It's not like people didn't tell her and it's not like she didn't go ahead with it anyway. Mm -hmm. So I guess it was a risk she was willing to take. She gambled with lives and she rolled the dice. I guess she was hoping it wouldn't happen. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. But she didn't do anything, didn't put any guardrails or anything to make sure that it didn't. And that is on her. Um, the, I saw another kit say, I knew this was going to happen. I didn't think it was going to happen so soon. I did. I I'm, did. I'm, you, you can't just one day turn around and pull the rug out from under someone mm -hmm. and expect them to not start reeling. And there's some people when they start reeling, they can't turn off their minds. They ruminate and ruminate and ruminate and they just see, you know, they just go down that path. It's like, wow, this is what my future is going to be. The, the amount of people that have come out to denounce her policy is, I just put a, a, a link in the chat to a story from the United Steelworkers, the union which says, Steelworkers, New Alberta anti-trans legislation abusive towards vulnerable children. Young Albertans and all young Canadians des deserve the freedom to be themselves and to learn and grow in a safe environment. The new legislation introduced by Daniel Smith's provincial government rolls back much needed protection for trans and queer youth at the moment they most need support, infringes on the health care and the bodily autonomy of trans children and youth, and violates their basic human rights. Our union as trans-identified members, as well as members who have trans-identified or non-binary ch non children who will be harmed by this new legislation that takes away their choices. That's Scott Lenny, Director for Western Canada of the United Steelworkers Union. Now, think about that for a second. United Steelworkers Union, these are hardcore construction people. And they came out 
to denounce her policy. This is like one of the most macho jobs there is in construction is steel work. And they are denouncing this. And they're standing with their union brothers and sisters and members to say, this is wrong. This will harm people. So when the steel workers come out and make that commentary, open your eyes and pay attention. And that was February 1st. Correct. And then there's uh, Kit Tabby G um, forwarded to me something by uh, someone named Chad Omen on Twitter who wrote to Daniel Smith, Premier, today I learned that a friend of mine had Calgary police at his door this weekend to inform him that his transgender nephew committed suicide in Edmonton. His choice to end his life had a direct and contributing factor, your decision to restrict the rights of trans people and parents of trans kids and youth in Alberta. I implore you to listen to Dr. David Keegan's submission to the breakdown tonight linked here. He draws a direct line to your decisions for his nephew's death. How many more transgender Albertans will paramedics have to cut down for you to reconsider your decisions? What happened to the 2014 Danielle Smith becoming emotional in the legislature about transgender rights? If you are a so-called libertarian, you sh should you not trust physicians and psychologists with these decisions? Respectfully, Chad Oman. I, um... <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, Cassie. Get Cassie. And then, meanwhile, David Parker and his friends got enough people to sign a petition for Westlock, Alberta, to remove their pride crosswalk, as well as a, mm -hmm. a couple of other things that happened in Westlock. There, there, there is, um, my community is being scapegoated. Yeah, of course. We are seen as uh, attacking us is seen as a, the express ticket to power. I am. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say. There's nothing to say, sir. It's, uh, this is the tip of the iceberg, unfortunately. This is going to continue happening. It's, it's, it's going to continue happening as long as policy of that type is allowed to get moved forward by governments whose number one job, remember, is to protect their people, not, not actively harm them. This is bad, and it's going to happen a lot more. And you know what? Every time it happens, every time it happens, we need somebody to do what that gentleman just did and call into a show and make the information knowledgeable and public, public for everybody to know and understand what happened and why. <sighs> you hold the government responsible for the things that they do that harm people, period. <sighs> Residents of Westlock, Alberta voted in favor of a bylaw Thursday that brands crosswalks and flags supporting political, social, or religious movements or commercial entities. Just over 1,300 people voted with 663 or 50.9% voting in favor and 639 voting against. So that whole town is divided now. Mm -hmm. The vote means the town can only raise federal, provincial, municipal government flags on public property. Crosswalks in the town located about 90 kilometers northwest of Edmonton can also only be painted a standard white striped pattern. The bylaw, which goes into effect within 30 days, forces the removal of Westlock's only rainbow crosswalk painted last summer between Town Hall and the Royal Canadian Legion in support of the 2S LGBTQ plus community. Um, and uh, the motion banning flags also prevents things like Indigenous groups from flying their flags. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a bigoted, uh, prejudicial motion built on racism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, all the bad phobias, basically. Is there a good phobia? I don't think so. I've yet to encounter one. All these people are again saying that uh, we don't take issue with promoting minority communities. We just believe governments should remain neutral. That's really? Shit. Government should remain neutral on what? 
acknowledging the humanity of all of the citizens that they are purportedly to represent? There is a... Cassie says, there's a strong movement in Westlock to have rainbows everywhere on private property, yes. And according to uh, Kit Linda, uh, there's an Ontario businessman that has made rainbow artwork and signs available for free to anyone in Westlock that wants to show how they feel. Yeah, and again, that. that vote out of 1,300 people, 663 voted for, 639 voted against. It passed by 0.9%. So that's complete division. Complete division in that town. Yeah. Wonder, wonder when uh, Paul Ev or Smith will make a comment about it. Oh, that's right, they won't. Uh, I'd love to see them get asked it, though, and then see what happens. <sighs> there are things that politicians are doing right now. And people who support them, or people that support certain causes, there's things that they're saying, there's things that they're doing, there's laws that are passing, there are ways that they are behaving in public. Uh, that they think, believe, advances a cause. Whatever it is, whether I support the cause or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but also has consequences on other people. And we seem to be at a very selfish stage where uh, my cause entitles me to do or say or pass whatever legislation I want. And if there's consequences on other people, <clears throat> oh, oh well. They had it coming or... They weren't tough enough or, and that's one of those reasons, for example, I'm having problems, you know, not being, I can't be totally happy with what's happening within the conservative movement with the way that David Parker is using Jenny Byrne because speculating about whether people are being unfaithful in other people's relationships can destroy relationships. Taunting someone because of their alleged alcoholism in public is certainly not a way to help them remain off the bottle if that's something that they're trying to do. Introducing legislation that pulls the rug out right from under people who thought that their rights were secure, that their access to health care was secure definitely sends people into a tailspin. Yeah. Holding a vote on whether or not the place where we live should respect the inherent humanity and dignity of every single person in the community and seeing that vote go no. There are some among us who we don't have to respect. <sighs> These have consequences. Mm -hmm. It's not just words. Well, look at what happened to um, that young person in, was it Missouri? Are you talking about Next Benedict? Yes. Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Thank you. Uh, beaten to death in the bathroom. Or the washroom, the toilets at, at her school. At their school, sorry, non-binary, correct? Yep. Yeah, so this is what it leads to. It's what it leads to. And it's not going to stop. I mean, we've, we've come so far, and now we're sliding backwards. And you, sir, remember what was happening here in Canada's capital, about a five-minute walk from where I live, a ten-minute walk from where I live just literally at the end of my street and turn right, Majors Hill Park, 
gay men were getting thrown off cliffs in the early 90s here in Ottawa, Canada's capital, the enlightened city, the most educated city in the country. This is what was happening here. We've come a long way since then, but we're sliding backwards and we cannot allow this. We cannot allow this. We need to take it to these politicians who are coming up with programs and legislation such as this and let them know you're going to get people killed. You just did. And it's not going to stop. You are ginning up hatred in people. You are rage farming. And that rage is getting people killed. And people will take their own lives, such as this person's trans nephew did. And it's not going to stop until we pull these politicians out of their positions of power and change the legislation that is not harmful. Democracy is, democracy is something you do. Let's damn well do it. Let's do it together. Because we cannot allow for hatred to be legislated. Because that's what it is. And it's wrapped up in a tidy bow with the soft music and the lighting, the way, the way uh, Mr. Nenshi talked about. There's but a, I, I, I was hopeful, you know, it yeah. had the soft music and the soft lighting. She had the, the nice tone. And then we heard what we had to, what she had to say and realized that this is not going to help people. It's going to harm them. There's a thing that I keep on saying. It's a rule of life that I have that every single person on this planet, no exceptions. Mm hmm doesn't matter how awful you are is deserving of a minimum of respect just by virtue of the fact they exist and breathe the same air and share the same planet you do. Everything else from that point on is earned, but there's an entry level amount of respect that everyone deserves for just existing mm -hmm. because everybody has a soul and everybody has an essence and everybody has a certain authenticity and then things happen in life that get people to try and move away from that or protect stuff or change or get jaded or whatnot but the trick, at least I've learned in my own life, to being happy and optimistic is um, that a source for good is to, to know who you are, who your true authentic self is, and know what kind of person you want to be. And then live according to that. And when people try to do things to you, or when life happens to you, you have a terrible experience. It's yes, to learn from that experience so that you can continue going about your true being, your true and authentic self. But in a matter that's a little wiser or more learned or less naive. But to not let it jade you or make you hard. I'm a very loving person. Mm -hmm. There are things in my life where my love and my trust have been betrayed. I could have put a wall around my heart and my emotions saying nobody's going to get in. Now, there was a time I did that. There was a time where you know, my life philosophy is that you can trust nobody except yourself. So always keep that distance and don't let people in or you're allowed in, but only so far. And I will never ask anybody for help because, well, that puts you in a sense of obligation or debt. And that worked for me for a while. Mm -hmm. Relying completely on myself and it worked for a while until it didn't 
And when it did it, I ran right into a brick wall. And it hurt. It hurt a lot. And I was in a bad place because um, I had tried all the things that I knew how to try that had worked for me before. Mm -hmm. And they weren't working. And a friend of mine, who I love very much, who is now a Buddhist monk. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, taught me about forgiveness. And uh, taught me that uh, forgiveness is a gift you first give to yourself. When you let go of things. <sighs> Sorry. When I know you apologize you for yeah. things. Whether someone accepts your apology or not, it doesn't matter. You've forgiven yourself. You've forgiven yourself. And, and that, that, is, that is so important, whether you realize it or not. It's so important because once you forgive yourself, you can heal. And whether they accept, you know, whatever, whether you, you, you are able to pave over whatever it was or rebuild the bridge or whatever the case is, that's irrelevant. Once you forgive yourself is when you can heal properly. And, and you need to be able to do that. And conversely, when someone has done something wrong to you and you've tried to talk to them about it and they still don't acknowledge it and they don't see it, you forgive them anyway. You need to get to a point where you forgive them anyway. Mm -hmm. It's not for their benefit. It's for your own because... Right? Carrying that around, that anger, that resentment, is just, it's just slow time released poison on yourself. <sighs> Forgiveness is a gift you first give yourself. It allows you to unburden yourself from stuff that you did that was wrong and that you acknowledge and you want to change. And it also unburdens you from carrying stuff that other people tried to put on you. Mm -hmm. That's not yours to carry. That's not your load. It's not easy. If forgiveness was easy, we'd all be doing it. Right? As I keep on saying, we all have baggage. Just does yours fit in the carry on? Are you it's dealing with it as you go? Yeah. Are you removing some of it out as you go? Because you can't carry it. It's, and that, that, that lesson opened up a lot of things for me, and it allows me to be the person that you see today that, you know, oh my God, you have such a big heart, or you're so caring, or so nice. Don't let that fool you. Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that I can't be hard in a moment or that I'm a pushover. I will stand or I won't stand up for myself. I mean, we talked about this this past summer when you know, my neighbor a couple of doors down mm -hmm. launched a slur at me and you know, I stood up for myself. It's it's there. I can do it if I need to. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to I would to. just rather not have to. Mm -hmm. And so I try to arrange my life in that way. This, but I don't want for an incident like that to happen to me. And then turn around and says, all right, well, you're a fucker. I'm right, right. I could have gone after him. All I wanted was somebody to talk to him, to let him know that that is not acceptable. But I also gave the man a way out. Mm -hmm. Saying if he's willing, let him know that if he's willing to go back to the way things were, I am prepared to move on. And pretend like it didn't happen. Not pretend. It's not pretend like it didn't happen. So it did happen. And I'm not all it. I'm not forgetting. But I'm forgiving. And forgiving means that every time I see him on the street and he says hello to me, mm. I don't bring that back and I don't hold it over his head. Mm -hmm. Now, if he does it again, that's okay. This was the second time and I gave you a chance. You know what? We have to move on. 
But the first one is everybody's entitled to make a mistake. I'm going to assume that you were not having your best moment. And I will give me, I will give you a chance to show me that you are not that person I saw on that day. Now, some people don't deserve that chance. You gotta, you know. Mm. Somebody that's been very abusive to you for a long time or whatnot, you need to choose yourself at some point and just get out. But I always congratulate people. Say, congratulations, you, for choosing you. But if people do you wrong and you let that change your core, you might have to change the way that you enter situations. You have to be more cautious about stuff, you know, like this. But if you let it change, and, and that's just living life smarter. But if you actually let it change who you are as a person, moving away from what your light is, they win. They've got a hold on you. <clears throat> so... I really wish we could live in a world where people thought more about what it is that they could do, how what it is that they do can have an impact on someone else that's negative and say, you know what, yes, I really want this, but not that badly. So I might temper my ask. But... We seem to be living in a world where politically that's not what's in fashion at the moment. So we are going to keep on seeing incidences of this. We are. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I don't like saying that, but it's a fact. It's a fact. Until the legislation is struck down, until the government is changed, until actual sensible policies are in place where people have bodily autonomy, at every age, this is going to continue to happen. And I know that it seems like sometimes I have opinions that are really firm and trenchant, and particularly when it comes to rights. Mm -hmm. it's like, and it leads me to have some very passionate discussions with people. People go, we're going, yeah, but what about this? It's like, no, there is a principle. Yeah, but what about this? You can no. give me all the exceptions you want. There is a principle. And you either adhere to that principle or not, right? We were talking about it with Robert Picton. Mm -hmm. like every citizen gets a hearing, gets a chance to make their case. No matter how awful they are, once you start moving away from that principle, it becomes easier to apply it unevenly to people depending on what else it is about them that you like or don't like. Then it becomes not only being an awful person, it becomes the, bear, the, the criteria. That bar keeps on getting lowered and lowered. And then at one point it just becomes random. That's why you have to stick and defend the principle. We all have worth. We all have dignity. And because we're all, I said, maybe not all in the same boat, but definitely all in the same ocean, life is hard. Figuring out who you are in this world truly is hard. And then living according to that is hard. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of people that try to make it harder. In fact, we have some people that are paid. There are whole industries mm -hmm. that exist for the sole purposes of making that harder. It's really tough in this day and age to be your actual authentic self. When you're bombarded with a whole bunch of messages about 
who you should be or what other people are. And a lot of these are gross distortions. Life is hard. So the basic principle that everyone you encounter, no matter what you think of them based on their behavior, is still entitled to that minimum of respect. The basic respect all of us wants want when we just show up. That minimum, that entry level. And nobody should be denied it. If we start moving away from that principle, we are fucked. Mm -hmm. That's what I say. When I say democracy is something that you do, and sometimes you've got to put your body into the game. It's, these are not just slogans. Lives depend on it. Lives depend on it. Well, here's something you may find um, might lift your heart and soul a little bit, sir. Uh, Jody Stonehouse to run for leadership of Alberta's official opposition, NDP. Uh, I have a video clip. It's about 45 seconds. I'm going to show you this because I think this will make you feel a little bit better. Maybe. Pack your bags, Danny. You know, the beautiful thing about Alberta is that we're part of Canada. We're stronger together and we look after one another. Alberta will never be the United States of America and we will never join the United States of America and First Nations will make sure of that. Our treaties are with the Crown, with Canada. Turtle Island is all Indigenous land. Yes, we don't recognize that medicine line, but insofar as our politics, we are Canadian, we are Albertans, we are proud, and we work together. Danny, we are not going to privatize healthcare. We are not going to pull out of the CPP, and we are not joining Texas. This is Alberta. We are part of Canada. Start packing your bags. Pack your bags. So, a little bit of hope there for you. A little bit of hope. All right. Uh, Mr. Grisley, do we have a, a show? I believe we do, sir. There's, uh, I, I posted a couple of links in the chat for a couple of things, but I did want to bring up this because this is just the, the has to be the dumbest thing I've ever read today so far. Missouri law says pregnant women can't get divorced. Oh God. As it stands, Missouri judges cannot fin legally finalize a divorce if a woman is pregnant. Three other states have similar laws, Texas, Arizona, and Arkansas. While a couple can still file for divorce in Missouri, the court must wait until after a woman gives birth in order to finalize child custody and child support. I... <sighs> the Handmaid's Tale is not a fucking manual. <sighs> Jeez. Um, <It's>, yeah. Uh, <sighs> oh, God. All right. Uh, kids and Cubs. That's the episode of this ep uh, that's the episode yeah. of this episode. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless, so please uh, share this with your peeps and poops. If you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you do not have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl. She sponsored our pod page, and if you scan that QR code under my chin, that will bring you directly to our site. If you're listening, that's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it will come directly to you. Uh, apologies for those who had been waiting for Thursday's or Friday's show uh, over the course of the weekend uh, with the cold. I just took some time to, for self-care, but uh, they are up now, I believe. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, uh, uh, if I'm not, I have one more. Right. I have Fridays to post. Yeah, Fridays up. Thursdays, okay. Thursdays, so. Thursdays yeah. is up. Um, if you would like to support us in other ways, make like Elaine and go to our YouTube channel. 
uh, True North Eager Beaver Media, and uh, click like, share, and subscribe there. That helps us out a lot. And if you'd like to help us out in other ways, the QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head there uh, brings you to our coffee page and the Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund. That's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And there you can make your contribution. Everything that uh, you donate is particularly appreciated. But if you're not able to donate, just you know, word of mouth and sharing our episodes uh, definitely um, makes us very, very, very happy and helps a lot. And so if you're watching on everything, if you're watching on any one of a number twi- uh, a number of Twitter platforms or Facebook, because we're on a, a bunch of platforms, or even Twitch, you can scan that QR code next to my head. And that will take you directly to our YouTube page where uh, you can join in the chat with the rest of the damn fam if you so desire. There you go. Um, because democracy is something that you do. Um, if you are in uh, the Hamilton area, remember that Camp for Kindness is still going on. I see that Kit Leanne is uh, making her way there today. And I believe that goes on until Wednesday. We are uh, very happy to uh, be uh, supporting that. Mm-hmm. with uh, however we can i mean it's literally just our encouragement and our promotion on it we're not really doing all that much it's the people over there who are doing all the work um so credit where it's due but uh whatever we can do to support and champion that we can because uh homelessness is a choice it's a policy choice mm-hmm. and uh, we need our politicians to make uh, better decisions and if uh, we can shame them into it um that's just as good works for me works for me uh write those letters and uh yes uh what do i want we wanted to bring you a letter that was written uh, mr grizzly put it in the chat but we will talk about it tomorrow it's because, in the chat again right now yeah I just reposted it because it's it's, it's damn good uh, it's when damn i good. when i tell people to write letters that's a that's a, an over and above <laughs> example of how to do it i mean the person even has footnotes for love of footnotes <laughs> they, they did the work they, they did, did the work they did the work they did the work it doesn't have to be like that but the it's a prime example so we will we will be presenting it um but yes write those letters and uh, if you're in alberta um let premier smith know um mm-hmm. Be respectful. As you can. As if you're not, uh, you just get tuned out. So try to be as respectful. Um, Make sure you let them know that you believe their policy led to this person's death. Put a little spicy. Because, mm-hmm. you know, bring your passion, not your fire. Bring a little heat. But keep it such that you won't make someone you know, just crumple up the paper. Write your first draft like that. Mm-hmm. Get it all out. But then write the version you're going to send. In a matter of that, uh, make sure that it gets read and not tuned out after the second line. But let them know. Let them know. Uh, Mr. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, do you have any words of wisdom, please? You know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, exasperated, as I always am, but it's policies that are, are designed to, to harm people, which is what this policy of Daniel Smith that she's brought forward, it's designed to harm people, plain and simple. And it... it it robs me of being kind to people because I'm angry and pissed off. And, you know, I always preach kindness and I'm a pacifist, but some days you just want to punch somebody in the face. Don't do it. Do not do it. But it's okay to feel that way. Just don't act upon it. I would suggest you go to the gym and hit a punching bag or ride a bike or go for a walk or a run. Get your anger out however you must, but don't harm anybody in the process. And then channel your anger into energy that you can use to make change. Write your MP, your MPP, your MLA. Write them. Tell them that you're pissed. Tell them why you're pissed. And tell them that this cannot stand in a country of Canada in 2024. 
All right. Uh, Kit Cassie, please uh, give a big hello to your cowboy from us <laughs> as he licked the button. <laughs> but get James Douglas, if you feel your nipples tighten in the next five minutes, that's just me sending good vibes. <laughs> uh, y'all are wonderful, kids. Y'all are wonderful. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, please cue the rooster. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. We have uh, Kit James in the chat who also says that I, I think he's managed to book uh, David Parker mm. as well. So, um, yeah. Um, I mean, like I said, uh, good luck uh, to you guys who are doing that. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I hope that you have good interviews. Um, you know, uh, I know some people are wondering like I said, like I said, I even wonder about the benefit of having it all, but having them on. But I know that Dean and James don't let statements go unanswered because mm-hmm. there's a difference between you know softball interviews and actually challenging people. So I'm sure that uh, that will happen. Um, I don't know how productive a use of time it is. Um, I, I I wouldn't look. It, <clears throat> If you were to have him on this show, I would just have to be uh, strictly a producer because I would not be able to be as calm as you can be. I would be screaming my head off at him. I'm telling you that right now. Keep in mind, folks, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a reporter. I'm not a writer. I'm just a guy who worked in construction for 29 years. Now works in in an office who has a microphone and a voice and can sometimes get loud. And I have extreme privilege because, you know, cis hat white male, I need to put that to use to make change for better. And when a shit gibbon like David Parker says and does the things he does to affect legislation in the province of Alberta that brings harm to people, I can't be quiet about that and I won't be nice about it. So no. If he's ever on this show, I will be a producer only. I will not comment because it would not be constructive. Yeah. My thing is, like, there's part of me that would want to have him for the same reason James does, you know, let's have a conversation and, like, let me point out a couple of things and see if you can handle them. But um, There are other people doing that and they're better at it than I am. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think I'm going to leave that to them. Um, And maybe that's why you won't see people like this on uh, that on, on this show. Um, It's not a, um, it's not a personal thing. Just think that maybe it's not my skill set. There are people that do it better. Um, Kit Toronto Dan uh, says to watch, um, what show is it, uh, Toronto Dan? Uh, remind us again on March 8th because uh, Mark Schreiner, the leader of the Green Party, will be on. And uh, Toronto to Dan is, uh, is um, participating in that show, I think, as uh, either co host or co interviewer on that mm-hmm. one. So, and I think it'll be his first interview. So, uh, that'll be fantastic. Well, I'd um, like to get Mike Schreiner on here, but I'd also love to get Merritt Styles on this show if we could as well and we'll work on that and, um, and i'm going to be uh writing to uh, reaching out to uh, the pm's office to see if we can get him to join us at some point in time for a beer 
Okay. That's a Neil Matheson show on YouTube on uh, March 8th for uh, Kit Dan. So keep reminding us of that and we'll keep promoting it on this to remind our viewers to check it out. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, I did finally find the mashup. Yeah, it does look like Max Fawcett. Indeed, hey? So it was a, a parody account for Pierre Polyverf. So I said to David Parker, David, real men are all going to my barber for a makeover. I mean, look at me now. So David did, and now he's jacked. Beat them off, David. Beat them off with the stick. And it's sort of like, I don't know. David kind of looks like Max Fox in there. <laughs> and uh, there's one other thing that I said to you, Mr. Grizzly, that yeah. might yeah. actually... Um, lighthearted lift. Lighthearted. Because, uh, yeah. <laughs> The one fabulous duck. <laughs> There's always got to be one, darlings. There's always got to be one. <laughs> All right. Well, take care. I'm out of here. I got to go. I'll see you. Bye.